R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 4, Chapters 1 through 7. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 1 Lee Makes His Last Desperate Plan. No food, no horses, no reinforcement. As that dread specter of ultimate defeat shaped itself, Lee did not content himself with reorganizing his army. Daily, as he sought to find provisions to keep his men from starvation, he wrestled with his strategic problem. Early was still in the Shenandoah Valley, guarding the Virginia Central with a few shivering cadres and under orders to create the impression, if he could, that his command was formidable. Beauregard was seeking to muster a sufficient force to dispute Sheridan's advance up the coast. Bragg had some 6,500 effectives in eastern North Carolina. These were the only troops of any consequence left in the South Atlantic states, except for the Army of Northern Virginia. To dispose of Bragg and of Beauregard so that he could concentrate all his strength against the ragged divisions that defied him in front of Petersburg, Grant moved with swift assurance. He followed the strategy of partition. Having halved the Confederacy by seizing the line of the Mississippi and capturing Vicksburg, Grant had then divided the eastern half of the revolutionary states by sending Sherman through Georgia to the sea. Now, with only South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia to be subdued, he brought from Tennessee some of the troops that had wrecked Hood at Nashville. These he united with Terry's troops below Wilmington, placed the whole under Major General John M. Schofield and directed him to advance westward against Lee's lines of communication along the seaboard from Weldon. If this operation were successful, Virginia would be severed from the Carolinas, and if Sherman moved northward, joined Schofield, and marched with him to reinforce Grant, Lee would face three armies. By January 29th, this danger had so far developed that Lee frankly warned the president. In case Grant were appreciably reinforced, he said, I do not see how in our present position he can be prevented from enveloping Richmond. There was at the time only one ray of light, the possibility of a negotiated peace. Francis P. Blair, Sr., had been in Richmond on January 12 on his own initiative, in the hope that a settlement might be effected, and out of that visit had developed a proposal for the dispatch of a peace delegation to Washington. Three leading Southerners, Vice President Stevens, Judge J. A. Campbell, and Senator R. M. T. Hunter, had gone to the federal lines on the 29th and, after some parleys, had proceeded to Hampton Roads. There they conferred unofficially with President Lincoln. The whole South hung on the meeting, which, however, ended on the day it began, with no apparent possibility of an understanding. The hopes of many were dashed, and the resolute saw in Mr. Lincoln's uncompromising stand a warning that the war would have to be fought to the finish, but there were some who hoped that out of the conference a tangible basis of peace might still develop. General Lee had watched the pourparlers, of course, with profound interest, but there is little evidence that he expected agreement. Knowing as he did the desperate plight of his army, the growing confidence of the North and the illimitable resources at the command of President Lincoln, it is hardly probable that he expected the Union to offer any other terms than surrender. On the very day that the disappointed Southern commissioners came back to Richmond, General Lee had to confess to President Davis that he could not send reinforcements to Beauregard, and that Beauregard, with such resources as he could muster, would have to make an effort to defeat Sherman wherever he can be struck to most advantage. A little later, after he had seen the suffering of his hungry men during the operations of February 5-7 around Hatcher's Run, he again put the Secretary of War on notice, you must not be surprised if calamity befalls us. Long conference with Mr. Davis and the Secretary on February 1316 disclosed no way of averting that calamity. Lee had always refrained from discussions with politicians on subjects that affected his military duties, but he now thought the situation so desperate that he determined to see Senator R. M. T. Hunter, a personal friend and one of the commissioners who had conferred with Mr. Lincoln in Hampton Roads. Visiting Hunter one evening, he talked with him nearly all night of the outlook for peace. If Hunter thought there was any prospect of peace otherwise than by surrender, it was Hunter's duty, Lee said, to propose it. The senator had what seemed to him the best of reasons for not doing so, and he explained them. He had been to the president, he confided, and had told him that if peace be had on any terms short of surrender, he should seek it. 
Davis had refused and, as Hunter believed, had circulated a report that the senator had lost all hope of Southern victory and was in despair. Until this incident was cleared up, Hunter insisted he would confer no more with the president. Lee repeated his suggestion and added that if he himself were to propose peace negotiations publicly, it would be equivalent to surrender. Hunter agreed, but argued that if Lee thought the chance for success desperate, he should so advise the president. To this, Hunter wrote, Lee made no reply. In the whole of this conversation he never said to me he thought the chances were over, but the tone and tenor of his remarks made that impression on my mind. He spoke of a recent affair in which the Confederates had repelled very gallantly an attempt of the Federals to break his line. The next day, as he rode along, one of the soldiers thrust forth his bare feet and say, General, I have no shoes. Another would declare, as he passed, I am hungry, I haven't enough to eat. These and other circumstances betraying the utmost destitution he repeated with a melancholy air and tone which I shall never forget. While the administration refused to face the dread reality, Schofield became a menace. Sheridan was on the march. He entered Columbia, S.C., on February 17 and forced the evacuation of Charleston that night. Lee watched him with eyes that saw all too plainly what his advance boded. He wrote on February 19, It is necessary to bring out all our strength, and, I fear, to unite our armies, as separately they do not seem able to make head against the enemy. I fear it may be necessary to abandon our cities, and preparations should be made for that contingency. The expedients of desperation were tried. Longstreet took advantage of a conference with the Federal General Ord to propose a conference between Lee and Grant in the hope that formal negotiations would eventuate. Richmond was frantic with excitement, at headquarters hope fluctuated from day to day. Lee repeated that the unhindered advance of Sherman would mean the severance of communications with the South and would force the evacuation of Richmond. General Bragg, in North Carolina, was so discredited by previous failure in the field that he could not rally the people of that state. General Beauregard, retreating from Charleston, was in ill health. He found that the militia of South Carolina would not cross the state line and that they consisted only of men between 50 and 60 and boys under 17 who were soon exhausted on the march. There was the direst need of a coordination of these forces under some man who had the military confidence of the Carolinas. Lee knew that Johnston held the good opinion of the people and was, perhaps, the only man who could bring out the last reserves, if even he could enlist them. Mr. Davis had not put Johnston at Lee's disposal and, indeed, had not acted on a joint resolution of Congress requesting him to restore Johnston to command of the Army of Tennessee. Instead, Davis had written, though he had not sent Congress, a memorandum of some 4,500 words in which he explained why he did not have confidence in Johnston as an independent field commander. This would have kept Lee from acting in anything less than a final, overwhelming emergency, but now he decided to put the necessities of the South above the opinion of the president. Tactfully arguing that if Beauregard should be incapacitated he would have no one to take his place, Lee on February 21 asked the Secretary of War to order Johnston to report to him for assignment to duty. This was promptly done, as Mr. Davis explained, in the hope that General Johnston's soldierly qualities may be made serviceable to his country when acting under General Lee's orders, and that in his new position those defects which I found manifested by him when serving as an independent commander will be remedied by the control of the General-in-Chief. On February 22, Lee placed Johnston in general charge of operations in the Carolinas, with instructions to collect the scattered troops in those states and to attack Sherman on the march, before he could form junction with Schofield. If this proved an impossibility, then Johnston must join Lee or Lee must join Johnston, for it was accepted by all that Lee could not attempt to remain near Richmond once Sherman reached Roanoke River, the next strong defensive line south of the Appomattox. Johnston speedily found that his army was suffering heavily from desertion. Instead of having 29,000, as estimated, he could count only about 15,000 effectives. There was little likelihood that he could break away and get to Virginia, and still less that he could be subsisted on arrival. By the harsh logic of elimination, Lee must prepare to leave the Richmond front and to move toward Danville to unite his army with Johnston's. Their one hope would be to strike Sherman, to destroy him, and then together to face Grant. As early as February 21st, Lee had been planning to organize a base at Buckville, the junction of the South Side and the Richmond and Danville Railroads.
Before the end of the month, the plan of a movement to Johnston was uppermost in Lee's mind. The coming of the blustery days of March found about 50,000 men under Lee's immediate command. It was a pitiful army with which to face such crushing odds, so pitiful that when Longstreet reported that he believed Grant would confer with Lee on a peace plan, the consent of the president was procured and a letter was dispatched to Grant on March 2, proposing an interview. Lee had no great expectations of a favorable answer. He wrote the president, I hope that some good may result, but I must confess that I am not sanguine. My belief is that he will consent to no terms, unless coupled with the condition of our return to the Union. Whether this will be acceptable to our people yet a while, I cannot say. Was there a suggestion in that yet a while, that reunion was inevitable and, so far as he was concerned, not unacceptable as an alternative to the bloody finish of a hopeless war? 28. Whatever hope he may have cherished of a favorable reception of his proposal was probably destroyed the day he wrote Grant. For on that same 2D of March, Sheridan attacked and overwhelmed the remnant of Early's little force at Waynesboro in the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley was irredeemably lost, and Sheridan was free to join Grant with his powerful mounted divisions. This news shook Lee to the depths. He wrestled with his conscience and his sense of duty. What should he do? His obligation to his government and to those half-frozen soldiers who must soon be overwhelmed in the trenches if the war went on, which came first. Long he debated it, on the night of March 3, pacing the floor of his quarters at Edge Hill. Longstreet and Hill were both distant. He could not discuss his problem with them, but he must unburden himself. With whom should he talk? In desperation, though the hour was late and the night was blighting in its chill, he sent for John B. Gordon, who by this time was one of his most trusted lieutenants. It was two o'clock when Gordon arrived. In Lee's room, Gordon wrote, many years later, was a long table covered with recent reports from every part of the army. He motioned me to a chair on one side of the table and seated himself opposite me. He opened the conference by directing me to read the reports from the different commands as he should hand them to me and to carefully note every important fact contained in them. The revelation was startling. Every report was bad enough, and all the distressing facts combined were sufficient, it seemed to me, to destroy all cohesive power and lead to the inevitable disintegration of any other army that was ever marshaled. Some of the officers had gone outside the formal official statement as to the numbers of the sick, to tell in plain, terse, and forceful words of depleted strength, emaciation, and decreased power of endurance among those who appeared on the rolls as fit for duty. Cases were given, and not a few, where good men, faithful, tried and devoted, gave evidence of temporary insanity and indifference to orders or to the consequences of disobedience. When I had finished the inspection of this array of serious fact, General Lee began his own analysis of the situation. Of his 50,000 men, only 35,000 were fit for duty, Grant must have 150,000, Thomas was sending 30,000 east. From the valley, said Lee, General Grant can and will bring upon us nearly 20,000, against whom I can opposite scarcely a vedette. Schofield and Sherman, between them, probably had 80,000, Johnston could only count on 13,000 to 15,000. Adding all the Union forces together, there would soon be in the seaboard states 280,000 federal troops, to whom the Confederacy could oppose only 65,000. This estimate ended, Gordon wrote, the commander rose, and with one hand resting upon the depressing reports, he stood contemplating them for a moment, and then gravely walked to and fro across the room. He again took his seat facing me at the table and asked me to state frankly what I thought under these conditions it was best to do, or what duty to the army and our people required of us. Looking at me intently, he awaited my answer. General, said Gordon, it seems to me there are but three courses, and I name them in the order in which I think they should be tried. First, make terms with the enemy, the best we can get. Second, if that is not practicable, the best thing to do is to retreat, abandon Richmond and Petersburg, unite by rapid marches with General Johnston in North Carolina, and strike Sherman before Grant can join him, or, lastly, we must fight and without delay. Is that your opinion? Lee asked. Gordon reiterated his views and deferentially asked if he might inquire how Lee appraised the outlook. Certainly, General, Lee answered. You have the right to ask my opinion.
I agree with you fully. A long discussion followed, in which Lee explained that he did not feel that he, as a soldier, had the right to urge political action on the government. He did not tell Gordon that he had already written Grant, for that was a confidential matter between himself and the president, but at length, as Gordon argued that he should advocate peace negotiations, Lee said he would go to see the president the next day, which, as a matter of fact, he had already planned to do. Journeying to the Capitol the next morning, Lee doubtless reviewed with the president the possibilities of negotiating peace, but the discussion was probably cut short by the receipt of Grant's reply to Lee's letter of March 2. In this answer, Grant declined a meeting. I would state, said he, that I have no authority to accede to your proposition for a conference on the subject proposed. Such authority is vested in the President of the United States alone. Lee might have been willing to negotiate on the basis of a restoration of the Union, but if he canvassed this aspect of the subject with the President, he discovered quickly that Mr. Davis was determined to have the Confederacy go down in defeat rather than accept any terms that did not recognize Southern independence. The conversation then turned to the dark necessity of evacuating Petersburg and Richmond. The chief executive faced this dread event with unshaken courage and, when Lee explained that he saw no alternative, Mr. Davis asked why Lee delayed, if the move had to be made, why should it not be undertaken forthwith? Lee replied that the condition of his animals was so reduced that they could not haul the wagon train until the wet and muddy roads had dried somewhat. Then the two debated the best strategy of the inevitable retreat. Hood had proposed that the Army of Northern Virginia make for Middle Tennessee, and Davis had forwarded Hood's letter to Lee for his criticism. Believing this course impracticable, Lee outlined the plan he was already formulating for a march to Johnston, a quick blow at Sherman and then an attack on Grant. To accomplish this, he went on, it would be necessary to build up a week's reserve of food in Richmond, to accumulate depots of supplies along the South Side and the Richmond and Danville railroads, and to issue more corn to the horses even if this depleted the scant stock the quartermaster general had on hand. This gloomiest of all the interviews between Lee and the Confederate president occurred on Saturday. The next day Lee worshipped at St. Paul's Church for the last time during the war, and then, bidding Mrs. Lee farewell, he returned to Petersburg. Gordon, of course, was anxious to know the outcome of the conference, but he found his chief under no delusions. Lee explained to the Georgian what had happened. He said, nothing could be done at Richmond, Gordon subsequently recorded. The Congress did not seem to appreciate the situation. Of President Davis he spoke in terms of strong eulogy, of the strength of his convictions, of his devotedness, of his remarkable faith in the possibility of still winning our independence, and of his unconquerable willpower. The nearest approach to complaint or criticism were the words, you know that the President is very pertinacious in opinion and purpose. What, then, is to be done, General? Gordon inquired. Lee could only answer that they must fight. In preparing to fight, Lee had to balance one time element against another. He could not wait long, because Sheridan would soon join Grant, and when that happened, the overpowering Federal cavalry could be employed to break Lee's communications with the South and to prevent their restoration. On the other hand, the horses had to be conditioned, and the depots must be prepared, as Lee had told the President, so that the movement to join Johnston could be undertaken. The new commissary general went vigorously to work building up the reserve that Lee needed. St. John estimated that 500 tons of commissary supplies had to be delivered daily in or near Richmond to subsist the army and to collect the special reserve of seven days' rations, which General Lee wished to be held subject to the order of his commissary. St. John affirmed that this delivery could be made if the military lines then occupied by the army could be held, and he did his utmost to make good his statement. The condition of the railroads was only too well known, St. John said in his final report. His assistant added, the means of transportation were constantly inadequate. Yet they contrived to improve the army ration, to fill sizable depots at Lynchburg, Danville and Greensboro, and to lay down in Richmond most of the special store General Lee desired. Perhaps, in doing this, St. John drew on the last foodstuffs that could be purchased with depreciated Confederate money, but he made the immediate outlook for provisions better than it had been for weeks. While the commissaries were working to supply the army for a move, the general plan of a junction with the forces of North Carolina was examined in every light and the alternatives were debated.
By March 9, Lee concluded that no marked success could be expected from Johnston's army. Two days later Johnston wrote frankly that if the federal forces in North Carolina were united, he could not prevent their march into Virginia. With this bad news Johnston coupled a suggestion, instead of Lee's moving southward and giving battle with combined forces, would it be practicable for Lee to hold one of the inner lines of Richmond with one part of your army and meet Sherman with the other, returning to Richmond after fighting? Longstreet had made a somewhat similar proposal in February. It had then been left in abeyance. Now, in the light of the information from Johnston, Lee began to canvass further the possibility of detaching part of his forces to assist his old comrade in crushing Sherman. In particular, Lee had General Gordon make a study of the federal center around Petersburg in order to ascertain whether the lines could be broken. When Gordon reported that this was feasible, in the vicinity of the federal Fort Stedman, Lee proceeded to work out a new plan. He was unwilling to risk a general offensive against the odds he faced in fortified positions because he felt that he should conserve his strength for the open campaign, but he believed that if Gordon could penetrate the federal lines after an assault by about half the army, one of two things would happen. Either General Grant would have to abandon the left of his line, or, what was more likely, he would have to shorten his front. This would make it possible for Lee to hold him with fewer men. Then, when Sherman was near enough to be reached quickly, Lee could detach picked troops to Johnston, effect a junction with that officer's little army and give battle to Sherman. If Sherman were beaten, Lee could then bring back his united forces to meet Grant. If Gordon did not succeed in breaking through the federal lines, Lee would be in no worse plight for executing his previous general plan of joining Johnston with all his forces for it was plainer than ever by this time that the Army of Northern Virginia would have to leave the Richmond defenses it have quietly awaited Sherman's approach to unite his army with Grant's. Manifestly, the success of this revised plan was highly contingent. Everything depended on breaking the federal front and on forcing Grant to shorten his line. But if this could be done the plan in obvious respects was an improvement on Longstreet's and on Johnston's. It involved less risk to Richmond, it did not demand the impossible in the way of supplies, and it took into account, as Johnston had not, the very definite limitations on the mobility of the army, both by road and by rail. Lengthening March days brought no relief of any sort. Sheridan spread destruction over a wide area as he moved to rejoin Grant. Johnston's army proved to be weaker than the most pessimistic estimates. Then, ominously, on March 23, Johnston reported that Schofield and Sherman had met at Goldsboro. That town was equidistant 120 miles from Lee and from Greensboro, his main base of supplies in western North Carolina, and was only 110 miles from the nearest point on the Richmond and Danville Railroad. Sherman's course, Johnston telegraphed, cannot be hindered by the small force I have. I can do no more than annoy him. I respectfully suggest that it is no longer a question whether you leave your present position, you have only to decide where to meet Sherman. I will be near him. The dreadful hour was drawing on. Sheridan, Lee believed, had already joined the Army of the Potomac. Grant was visibly preparing to attack on the Confederate right and to deprive Lee of the initiative. The Confederate commander could wait no longer, even for his horses to gain strength or for the heavy roads to dry. That night, he gave his final approval to the plan for the attack on Fort Stedman. Chapter 2, Fort Stedman March 25, 1865 Fort Stedman was on the high ground known as Hare's Hill, at the crossing of the Federal Lines and the Prince George Courthouse Road, three-quarters of a mile southeast of the Appomattox. The place could boast of no particular strength. It had no bastion and immediately adjoined Battery 10, which was open in the rear. The terrain behind the fort was almost as high as the parapet. In the sketch that follows, the numerals represent the federal batteries. The distance to Fort Stedman from the Confederate lines, at the point known as Colquitt Salient, was 150 yards, or probably less than at almost any other position on the whole of the defenses. Only 50 yards separated the pickets. The nearness of the fort, which made a surprise attack possible, was one of the reasons General Gordon selected Stedman as the object of his assault. Another reason was that as he studied the enemy's works from the Confederate front he saw what he took to be three federal forts in the rear of Stedman. Behind these was an open space. 
he believed that he could reach this cleared ground, form there, and take the three works in reverse. If he could do this and could spread his troops to the right and to the left for a sufficient distance, he argued that he would have a position of such strength and depth that he would divide the enemy's troops and could force the Federals to abandon that part of their fortifications to the south and southwest. In this way, General Lee's immediate purpose would be served. The Federals would have to shorten their front, and the Army of Northern Virginia would have a lessened stretch of lines to defend. Troops could then be detached from Lee to help Johnston. Gordon developed an elaborate stratagem. Some of the obstructions in front of the Confederate works at Colquitts were to be secretly and noiselessly removed during the night preceding the attack so as to afford sally ports. The Federal outposts were to be seized and silenced in the darkness before they could make outcry. Then fifty picked men were to chop down the abatis and chevaudefrise protecting Stedman. They were to rush the fort before daylight and were to be followed by three companies of 100 men each, wearing strips of white across their breasts to distinguish them in the darkness. Having entered the work, these three companies were to pretend that they were Federals driven from the front position and that they had been directed by the Federal commander to man the forts behind the lines. In this way, Gordon hoped to reach and to occupy the Federal rear with little or no opposition. The main body of his infantry was then to move to the left and right, up and down the Federal line. This done, cavalry were to go through the fortified area and destroy Grant's communications. Lee left the tactical arrangements almost entirely to Gordon and apparently he did not question the existence of the forts that Gordon said were in the rear of Stedman. At Gordon's request, however, he personally had inquiry made to find three guides who could lead the advance columns over the terrain behind Stedman. Gordon stressed the necessity of finding individuals who could make their way over ground where shells and picks had destroyed the landmarks. General Lee procured three men and had them sent to Gordon. He did not know them personally, he explained, but they had been recommended to him. Grimes's, Walker's, and Evans's divisions, comprising Gordon's corps, were to be used in the assault. In addition, Ransom's and Wallace's of Johnson's division from Anderson's corps, two brigades under Lane from Wilcox's division, and two under Cook from Haight's division, were ordered to report to Gordon. W. H. F. Lee's division of cavalry was instructed to come up from Stony Creek. Four and a half divisions of infantry and a division of cavalry, nearly half the army, concentrated close to the center, around Colquitt salient. This stripped the rest of the front almost bare of men and was in itself an evidence of Lee's desperation, especially as there were some indications of an impending federal attack on Longstreet's front. On the afternoon of March 24, Gordon requisitioned Pickett's division also, which was then north of the James. Lee doubted whether Pickett could arrive in time to support Gordon, but, he wrote, still we will try, and he promptly transmitted the order. Other brigades could be brought up, he told Gordon, and disposed as needed. Showing none of the misgiving he must have felt over the employment of more than 50% of his available infantry on a single mile of his long, long front, he concluded his letter to Gordon with characteristic words, I pray that a merciful God may grant us success and deliver us from our enemies. He directed Longstreet to be prepared to attack on the north side of the James the next morning and to take advantage of every circumstance that would prevent the transfer of troops to the south side of the river. Before dawn on the morning of March 25, the day set for the assault, General Lee rode over from the Turnbull House to the hill in the rear of Colquitt Salient, where Gordon was standing ready to give the signal to the men who crowded the trenches beneath him. The chevaux had been quietly removed at the designated sally ports, the pickets had crept forward and were ready to fall on the federal outposts before they could give the alarm, the fifty axemen were at hand, the selected three hundred were all duly marshaled and distinguished by strips of white cloth. Almost on the second, at four o'clock, a single rifle, fired by a private at Gordon's word, sent the troops forward. Lee could only wait on the hill and listen and hope. Very soon a message came from Gordon, who himself had followed the charging troops, the men were in Fort Stedman and the 300 were on their way to the rear. The sound of the firing must soon have apprised Lee that the attacking columns had spread 400 or 500 yards on either side of the salient they had stormed. The next news was of another sort, the officers of one party, Gordon reported, could not find the rear forts, on the seizure of which the success of the whole enterprise depended. The guide had been lost. Another courier brought a similar report from the other advance parties.
Then followed confused fighting, not much of which Lee could see. Soon it was apparent the Federals had rallied, were hurrying up reserves, and were pouring into Fort Stedman and the adjoining part of the line of fire that was holding up the advance. Lee saw that an attempt to storm the Federal redoubts would be risky and, even if not repulsed, would cost him heavily, so, about eight o'clock, he ordered Gordon to withdraw to his own lines. As the disappointed troops made their way back, they came under a cruel fire that dropped hundreds in their tracks. The survivors had a grim and humiliating story to tell Moss Robert. The men had reached and had entered Stedman precisely as Gordon had planned. The main column had fought its way along the trenches on either side, but the selected 300 had failed to find the three forts in the rear for the all-sufficient reason that these forts did not exist. What Gordon had taken to be supporting forts were, in reality, old Confederate works that had been occupied and lost during the fighting of the 15th-170th of June, 1864. Feudal search for these fortifications and the return to Fort Stedman had caused confusion and had given the Federals time to rally in their well-constructed works. Repeated attempts to storm Fort Haskell and Battery 9 had resulted in failure. From these works, from the reserve artillery on the hills in the rear, and from batteries 4, 5, and 8, a smothering fire had been poured into those parts of the line that Gordon's men had occupied. Except at a very heavy loss of life, it had not been possible to advance. To remain was useless in itself and involved continuing casualties and extension of the line and ultimate capture. The officers of some commands found some men unwilling to cross the open ground between the lines and to return to their works. They preferred capture to running the gauntlet. And the failure of the attack was not all that had to be told. Immediately following the repulse of Gordon's assaults, and almost before the Confederates had returned to their works, the Federals advanced along the whole right of Lee's position nearly to Hatcher's Run and took the entrenched picket lines. In this counterstroke, they captured about 800 prisoners and held their ground against all attempts to drive them back to their main lines. The enemy was thus placed where he could advantageously launch a direct attack to break the Confederate front whenever he chose to do so. The total haul of prisoners at the picket posts and at Fort Stedman was 2783. The Union estimate of gross Confederate casualties of 4800 to 5000 was not greatly exaggerated. Lee waited till the worst was known, waited till it was plain he could hope for no advantage, and then, wearily, he turned Traveler's head toward the Turnbull house. He had not gone far when he met two horsemen approaching him. He identified them quickly and smiled at them. They were Rooney and Robert, who had ridden ahead of their division, which had been ordered to follow the hoped-for advance of the infantry. The general thanked Rooney for coming so promptly on orders, his trooper son had ridden nearly forty miles with half-starved men and bare-ribbed horses, and expressed his regret that the attack had not so developed that the cavalry could be used. Since then, wrote Captain Robert Lee, nearly two score years afterwards, I have often recalled the sadness of his face, its careworn expression. The general did not tell his sons what the failure at Fort Stedman implied. Sadly he telegraphed Longstreet that Pickett would not be needed and that those of his men who had started from the north side should go into camp around Chester, briefly he reported to the Secretary of War on the morning's events. He did not probe the reasons for failure or blame either Gordon or his subordinates, but in the events of the day he saw his plan destroyed utterly. I fear now, he wrote the President on the 26th, it will be impossible to prevent a junction between Grant and Sherman, nor do I deem it prudent that this army should maintain its position until the latter shall approach too near. Johnston, he went on, reported only some 13,500 infantry, a loss of 8,000 men, largely by desertion. At that rate of attrition, Johnston would not cross the Roanoke with more than 10,000, a force that would add so little strength to this army as not to make it more than a match for Sherman, with whom to risk a battle in the presence of Grant's army would hardly seem justifiable. Johnston estimated Sherman and Schofield at 60,000. Grant might have 100,000 and, Lee feared, did not have less than 80,000. Their two armies united, he said, would therefore exceed ours by nearly 100,000. Besides, if Grant wished to bring Sherman's army to him without a battle, he could easily maneuver in such a way that if Lee marched out to meet Sherman the Confederates would have to fight both armies. Thus Lee was thrown back on the plan of evacuating the Richmond line and of moving with his whole force to join the command in North Carolina.
Even this plan was now modified by the fact that when Junction was formed, there would be no prospect of attacking and defeating Sherman alone, for Sherman would join Grant. As Lee had said when Longstreet proposed that Johnston be brought to Richmond, concentration by the Confederates involved like concentration by the Federals. The plan of a march to unite with Johnston was now complicated, also, by the arrival of Sheridan's cavalry after it had refitted at White House on the conclusion of a long raid eastward from the Shenandoah Valley. The approach of the premier federal cavalry had been assumed on March 17. On the very day of the attack on Fort Stedman, Fitz Lee had notified Longstreet that Sheridan, in his opinion, would be on Grant's left flank on the 28th or 29th. There were many indications by the 27th that Sheridan was moving to the south side of the James. The retreat from Petersburg must therefore begin. The sooner it was undertaken, the greater the prospect of eluding Grant. But there were obstacles, old and new, to a speedy withdrawal. Gordon's men needed rest for the recovery of their morale. The administration was not ready to evacuate Richmond. The roads were still excessively bad. Although what Colonel Taylor had guardedly styled the dread contingency had now become a foregone conclusion, even in his optimistic mind, Lee had to wait. He had sent pontoons forward, he had surveyed the ordnance stores, and he had prepared maps for the retreat, but, for the moment, all he could do was to strengthen the right flank, against which, rather than against Richmond itself, he had long believed the final attack would be delivered. In spirit, he could only repeat what he had written Mrs. Lee before the outlook had become quite so dark, I shall endeavor to do my duty and fight to the last. Chapter 3, Five Forks, A Study in Attenuation March 29 to April 1, 1865 The week beginning March 27, 1865, was one on which the survivors of the Army of Northern Virginia were loath to dwell, because it was to them, in memory, the first stage of a gruesome nightmare, but to the student of war it is a most instructive period. It illustrated both the possibilities and the limitations of the employment of infantry to support cavalry in dealing with a turning movement. Further, it will long remain a classic example of the manner in which even the highest skill in reconcentration may not avail in holding a long line against a very powerful adversary. The events of the week, indeed, might well serve as the basis of a study in attenuation. All Lee's intelligence reports on the 27th indicated that the anticipated federal movement was about to start and that it was directed against the upper stretches of Hatcher's Run. This meandering stream covered Lee's right flank. Rising some 15 miles west and southwest of Petersburg, it was not on the watershed of the Appomattox, but ran roughly parallel to that stream for about seven miles from west to east, and then turned to the southeast to become one of the affluents of the Nottoway. Between Hatcher's Run and the Appomattox ran the Southside Railroad, one of Lee's two essential lines of communication, via Bookville, with the fragment of the Confederacy not yet occupied by the Federals. The railroad, of course, was the prime objective of any attempt Grant might make on his left to drive Lee from Petersburg without a direct frontal assault. To reach the railroad, Grant's easiest course was to cross Hatcher's Run at a distance from Lee's lines, to march westward until he had reached a point beyond Lee's right flank, and then to strike northward. As the roads lay, this would carry Grant into a wooded country, cut by numerous small but troublesome watercourses, most of which were running high between muddy banks. The main features of the terrain as they affected Lee's military problem were as follows. Grant's easiest crossing was at Monk's Neck Bridge. Thence the way to the Southside Railroad led by Dinwiddie Courthouse and by Five Forks, where Lee already expected Grant's troops to appear. This route was only 15 miles, say a march of a day and a half as the roads then were. To attempt to meet this advance by merely lengthening his front, Lee would be compelled to extend himself from the point marked with the encircled X to the the encircled Y beyond five forks. This would be a prolongation of four miles, a distance Lee could not hope to cover adequately. Already he stretched this thin line almost as far as it would hold. On the 27 and a half miles occupied by infantry, he could count an average of only 1,140 men per mile. North of James River he had as defenders of his left flank Fitz Lee's division of cavalry. This numbered about 1,800 mounted men and was distant two days' march from the endangered right. Next the cavalry were Field's division of some 4,600 men and Kershaw's of 1,800. 
Their lines, which were fairly strong, extended slightly to the southwest of Fort Gilmer, two and a half miles from James River. It would take a minimum of 12 hours to get the leading brigade of either of these divisions to Petersburg. The only other forces north of the James were those around Chaffin's Bluff, namely a few field batteries, the heavy artillery units, which had very little transportation, the Virginia Reserves, and the local defense troops. The artillerists were about 750 in number and the total of reserves and local defense troops was 3,300, of whom about 1,100 were then on the lines. Altogether at this time, Lee thus could muster above the James a total of approximately 9,700 infantry, 1,800 cavalry and 750 heavy artillery. Even to do this, he had to call out all the reserves and local defense units. Without utilizing the local defense troops, he could dispose about 7,500 infantry. Exclusive of the infantry, only Field or Kershaw could possibly be used to reinforce the right. Between the James and the Appomattox, on and adjacent to the Howlett Line, were some heavy artillerists, a small detachment of naval gunners, and Mahon's division of infantry, about 3,700 muskets. This infantry held nearly five miles of line and manifestly could not be reduced, for if the Federals broke through there they would cut the army in half and destroy communications between Richmond and Petersburg. Gordon's Corps, with artillery support, occupied a sector from the Appomattox River just east of Petersburg to the point where lieutenants run past through the lines, directly south of Petersburg and about one mile east of the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad. This was a front of slightly more than four miles, on which Gordon, after the losses in the affair at Fort Stedman, had only 5,500 infantry, a force that would have been hopelessly inadequate if the works had not been strong and all the ranges established. Beyond Gordon, in order from left to right, were Wilcox's and Haight's divisions of A.P. Hill's Corps, extending from Lieutenant's Run to the works covering the Boydton Plank Road at Burgess Mill, on Hatcher's Run. This was a distance of more than eight miles, as the lines ran, and it was held by approximately 9,200 officers and men. To the right of Haight's division, protecting the White Oak and Claiborne roads in a bend of Hatcher's Run, lay Anderson's Corps, which consisted of little more than B. R. Johnson's division of about 4,800 infantry. There was no cavalry on this flank. W. H. F. Lee's division, as already explained, was at Stony Creek, 40 miles away, by road. Its strength was approximately 2,400. It was joined on the 28th by what was left of Rosser's division, some 1,200 sabers, brought down from the Valley of Virginia. The only force that could be accounted a reserve was Pickett's division, which had been transferred to the north side of the James on March 14 to meet an anticipated attack by Sheridan. The division, it will be recalled, had been ordered back to support the assault on Fort Stedman. One brigade, Stewart's, had reached Petersburg, but it was not needed in the operation and was held temporarily near the city. Two other brigades of the division were halted on Swift Creek, north of Petersburg. The remaining brigade, Hunton's, was still to the north of the James. The total strength of this scattered command was approximately 5,000. It had suffered very heavily from desertion. The density of the infantry and the character of the various zones, as of March 27, were approximately as follows. Zone and command. Infantry per mile. Per kilometer. Of defended line. North of the James. Cavalry on the left flank, 1800. Longstreet, with Fields and Kershaw's divisions, chiefly in field works, 5 miles. 1360, 850. Ewell, with Virginia reservists and siege artillery, in heavy earthworks, two and a half miles. 740, 460. Howlett Line. Mahone's division, heavy works with naval and siege artillery support, nearly five miles. 740, 460. From the Appomattox to Lieutenant's Run. Gordon, with Walker's, Evans's, and Grimes's divisions, heavy works, enemy very close, for miles. 1350, 840. From Lieutenant's run to Burgess's Mill. Wilcox's division of Hill's Corps, some heavy works, chiefly field works, about four and a half miles. 1100, 680.
Haight's division of Hill's Corps works of the same type as Wilcox's, though hardly as strong, except at Burgess's Mill, three and a half miles. 1200, 750. Average density of this zone. 1150, 710. Beyond Burgess's Mill. Anderson, with Johnson's division, Lightfield works on extreme right, three miles. 1600, 990. Average density, 31,400 men on 27 and a half miles of line defended by infantry. 1140, 710. Pickett's division, a quasi-reserve. 5,000. Cavalry at Stony Creek. 2,400. Ordered to Stony Creek, Rosser's division. 1,200. A pitiful situation, surely, for the only army of any consequence left to the Confederacy east of the Mississippi. What could Lee do with this scant force to meet the operation against his right? His first and obvious move, made on the 27th, was to transfer to that flank all the cavalry on the north side of the James, except Gary's brigade, which was left with Longstreet. From Stony Creek, of course, he could call up the rest of the cavalry when needed and thus could concentrate all his mounted troops on his extreme right. These three small divisions, however, could not possibly suffice to stop the movement, for on March 28 the report was that Federal infantry and artillery were continuing the march in great strength toward their left. Lee must have suspected that these troops were from the north side of the James for he telegraphed for information from Longstreet, whom he had cautioned five days before to be on the alert and to be prepared to release all the troops he could possibly spare. As a second step in his effort to protect his right, Lee executed the plan he had adopted at Longstreet's suggestion to support his cavalry attack with an advanced and quasi-independent force of infantry. He knew he might have to increase this force, but he hoped if the enemy attacked he could do this without being compelled to draw troops from the line in such numbers as to make a break inevitable. The plan of operations was, in short, a compromise between a major detachment of force and a long extension of front. Pickett's division was selected for this service with the cavalry, and arrangements were made to shift other troops down the line to the right as operations required. Curiously enough, there is no record of any preliminary discussion as to who should command the force intended for the defense of the right. It was on the 28th that Lee began to prepare for the movement of Pickett's division to the right. He delayed dispatching the troops only in order to assure himself that Pickett could be moved there without too great risks to the north side. He still had faith in his army and he told the administration that he believed it would have 10 or 12 days in which to evacuate Richmond. During the forenoon of the 29th, Lee received word that hostile cavalry and infantry, there was no mention of artillery, had started a march southwestward from the federal lines at Monk's Neck Bridge and had crossed Hatcher's Run. From the early reports, Lee was not certain of the immediate federal objective. He made his dispositions at once, however, taking McGowan's brigade of Wilcox's division from its position on the line east of Hatcher's Run, he spread the other brigades over the ground McGowan had covered and moved him westward beyond Burgess's mill. This arranged, Lee directed Pickett to move with the two brigades he had on Swift Creek, to pick up his third brigade in Petersburg and with these to go by train to Sutherland Station on the Southside Railroad, ten miles west of the city. Rooney Lee's and Rosser's divisions of cavalry were ordered to join Fitz Lee's command on the extreme right. A glance at the map will show that a cavalry raid on the Richmond and Danville Railroad around Buckville was almost as easy as a quick attack on the Southside Railroad east of that point. Consequently, Lee directed Pickett's other brigade, Hunton's, which was still on the north side of the James, to cross to Manchester, away from the congestion of the Richmond Yards and the allurements of Richmond Streets, and to be ready to follow the rest of the division, or, if need be, to go directly on the Richmond and Danville Railroad to protect the Buckville district. While these orders were being issued, Fitzley rode into Petersburg and reported the arrival of his division, which had been started the previous day from the extreme left. The commanding general told his nephew that Sheridan was in the vicinity of Dinwiddie Courthouse, was preparing to concentrate around Five Forks, and, in his opinion, intended to break up the Southside Railroad, which it was important to hold. Fitz Lee was to go there, where he would be joined by W. H. F. Lee and Rosser and by supporting infantry. He was to attack Sheridan, the one best way to break up the raid.
to ensure coordination among the cavalry divisions, which had not been under unified command since Hampton had left Virginia, Lee announced to his trooper kinsmen that the latter was to take charge of the cavalry corps. No written orders were given Fitz Lee. He construed his verbal orders most strictly, as will presently appear, and he held General Lee's view of the situation long after the whole complexion of affairs had changed. Later in the evening of the 29th, as a heavy rain began to fall, word came from Anderson that the advancing Federals had extended their left to Dinwiddie Courthouse, which was six miles from their starting point. Anderson had sent out two brigades to meet the cavalry, who proved to be Gregg's, but had been unable to drive them back and had withdrawn to his works. This extension of the Federal left to Dinwiddie Courthouse, with no determined push northward toward the railroad, forced Lee to consider the possibility that instead of starting a raid, Grant was lengthening his line toward the southwest. The natural counter-move, of course, would be a corresponding extension of the Confederate front, but was that possible? Hunton could be and was called to Petersburg, but beyond that, what could be done other than to bring over a part of Longstreet's corps? Old Pete was notified of the state of affairs and was told that he might be required to come to the south side with Field's division. Meantime, could Longstreet ascertain what troops were still in his front? Longstreet's answer was that, as far as he could learn, the force on the north side was as usual and that if Field were moved, the VM cadets and all the local defense troops should be called out to man the works. Soon the outposts reported that federal artillery had also gone with the infantry and cavalry. Thereupon Lee took the further precaution of ordering to the extreme right the fine artillery battalion of Pegram with twenty guns. Darkness fell in a continued downpour, with no further indication of what was ahead, except that on a large part of the Petersburg front heavy federal demonstrations were begun. These were continued all night, as if Grant was feeling out the line in an effort to prevent the movement of troops to the right. The transfer that Lee had ordered during the day left the situation on the evening of the 29th as follows. Zone and command. Infantry per mile. Per kilometer. Of defended line. North of the James. Cavalry on the left flank, approximately 500. Longstreet, with Fields and Kershaw's divisions, no change. 1360, 850. Ewell, with Virginia reservists and siege artillery, no change. 740, 460. Howlett Line. Mahone's division, no change. 740, 460. From the Appomattox to Lieutenant's Run. Gordon, with Walker's, Evans's, and Grimes's divisions, no change. 1350, 840. From Lieutenant's run to Burgess's mill. Wilcox's division of Hill's Corps, diminished by McGowan's brigade, density reduced from 1,100 per mile, 680 per kilometer, to 888, 552. Haight's division, strengthened by McGowan's brigade from Wilcox, density increased from 1,200, 750, to 1,550, 963. Beyond Burgess's Mill. Anderson, with Johnson's division, no change. 1600, 990. Moving. Pickett with 5,000 infantry to join Anderson. Cavalry, 4200, to right flank. Although no alarming news greeted Lee on the rainy morning of March 30th, he became convinced that he would have to strengthen his extreme right still more if he was to take the offensive against Sheridan. Any withdrawal from the line was, of course, exceedingly dangerous, but unless Lee was willing to have his right turned, what alternative was there? Grimly he ordered Gordon to take over two miles of trenches beyond the point where the flank of his troops rested, and then, having discharged the gloomy business of the army at headquarters, he rode out to the vicinity of Sutherland's. He found that Rooney Lee and Rosser had not arrived, but that Fitz Lee was advancing on five forks. Pickett had reached Anderson's headquarters and had reported to him on the night of the 29th, Lee promptly detached Pickett from Anderson and placed at Pickett's disposal Matt Ransom's and Wallace's brigades of Johnson's division, Anderson's corps, in addition to the three of Pickett's own division. Pickett was thereupon directed to march on Five Forks, to seize the initiative, and, with the cavalry, to march in the direction of Dinwiddie Courthouse for an attack on the flanking column of the enemy.
six of Pegram's twenty guns were to go within picket. The others were to remain at Burgess's mill. By these orders, Lee definitely set up the mobile force to protect the right flank, roughly 6,400 infantry and 4,200 cavalry. Having done this, all that he could do, Lee rode back to Petersburg. Don't think he was in good humor, an observant young officer wrote in his diary. Advancing to Five Forks, Fitz Lee saw nothing of the enemy. He then moved down the road toward Dinwiddie Courthouse, quickly established contact with the Federal Infantry and Horse, and after beating off two attacks, drove them back on their reserves. This done, he returned to Five Forks, where he met Pickett. That officer had started from White Oak Road for Five Forks, in accordance with General Lee's orders, but as his line of advance was closer to the Federals than that of Fitzhugh Lee, he was exposed to attack, in front and on the flank. The enemy made a rush on his wagon train, but was repulsed. Almost all the way to Five Forks he had to drive the enemy from his front. When at length he arrived, it was nearly sundown. In conference, Fitz Lee and Pickett decided that as the remainder of the cavalry had not joined them, and as the men were very tired, having marched with little rest for eighteen hours, they would delay until the next morning, the 31st, the combined offense of General Lee had ordered. Two brigades were thrown out about three-quarters of a mile south of Five Forks to cover the front. To do this, the troops had, ominously enough, to drive back dismounted Federal cavalry who used repeating rifles and offered stiff resistance. Soon after this was accomplished, W. H. F. Lee and Rosser arrived at Five Forks with their cavalry. Lee did not get a full report of all this, but by the close of the day he knew the mobile force on the right was facing tremendous odds. His information was that the units west of Hatcher's Run consisted of Sheridan's and Gregg's cavalry and of the V and parts of the II and VI Federal Corps. What could 10,600 hungry Confederates do against this host? Cool military judgment gave only one answer to that question, but so long as there was the least chance of success, Lee omitted no precaution. The removal of Johnson's two brigades to strengthen Pickett had left the infantry ten paces apart on the works within the bend of Hatcher's Run and west of Burgess's Mill. This position was important in itself and constituted the sector from which troops could be drawn most quickly in case further reinforcements had to be sent Pickett. Lee accordingly proceeded to place more troops there. McRae's brigade of Haight's division was passed from the eastern to the western side of Hatcher's Run and was held near Burgess's Mill. His sharpshooters were left behind. Scales's brigade was moved from Wilcox's left to a position across the Boydton Plank Road, west of Hatcher's Run and just south of Burgess's Mill. Hunton, who had come down from Manchester, was put in near the junction of the Claiborne and White Oak Roads, within the works at the bend of the run. The trenches abandoned by this shift to the right were taken over by Gordon in accordance with the orders Lee had given him that morning. These changes left the density of the line and the disposition of the troops at midnight, March 3031 as follows. Zone and Command Infantry per mile Per kilometer Of defended line North of the James Cavalry on the left flank, approximately 500 Longstreet, with Fields and Kershaw's divisions, no change 1360, 850 Ewell, with all local defense troops in position. 1320, 820. Howlett Line. Mahone, no change. 740, 460. From the Appomattox to Lieutenant's Run. Gordon, with Walker's and Evans's division, but extension of lines two miles to the right, density reduced on fronts of four miles from 1350, 840, to 870, 540. From Lieutenant's Run to Burgess's Mill. Grimes's Division of Gordon's Corps, Two Mile Front. 870, 540. Wilcox's Division, further diminished by Scales's Brigade, but with line shortened to about two and a quarter miles. 1100, 684. Haight's division, strengthened by Scales's brigade from Wilcox, line approximately three and three-quarters miles in length. 1785, 1110. Average density of this zone. 1370, 850. Beyond Burgess's Mill.
Anderson, with Johnson's division, less Matt Ransom's and Wallace's brigades, but with Hunton's brigade of Pickett's division added, three mile front. 1200, 745. Mobile force set up beyond right of fortified position at five forks, 6,400 infantry and 4,200 cavalry, 10,600 men. On the morning of the 31st, when Pickett and Fitz Lee were to advance against the enemy seeking to turn the Confederate right, General Lee rode down the line as far as the fortifications within the angle of Hatcher's Run. When he arrived, he found Union infantry in front of these works with their left in the air at a point about opposite the end of his own line. To take advantage of this carelessness, and to preclude the possibility of the Federals breaking through between Pickett's advancing column and Anderson's fortified position, Lee determined to attack and roll up the Union flank, though he had available for the task only four brigades, and those four, as it happened, from three divisions. Major General B. R. Johnson had two of these brigades, Wise's and Moody's, formerly Gracie's. Johnson accordingly was put in command, under the general supervision of Anderson, who seems to have had little or no part in the action. McGowan's brigade, which was still close to Burgess's mill, was moved over until it became the extreme right brigade. Moody was on McGowan's left. Then came Hunton. Wise was on the ground, but not in line. The two right brigades were placed under McGowan, who was selected to deliver an assault, to turn the Federal left flank, and to drive the enemy across the front of the other brigades. It had been raining since about 3 a.m., and was still raining when Lee made the arrangements for the attack. McGowan waited for the downfall to cease and then moved quietly out. He was getting himself into position, almost directly across the left flank of the infantry, under Lee's own eye, when firing broke out farther up the line. A lieutenant in Hunton's brigade, seeing the enemy, had sprung forward, had called on his men to follow him, and had opened the fight without waiting for orders. McGowan had perforce to launch his attack at once. The action had not progressed far when Lee saw that Hunton might lose contact with the troops on the line toward Petersburg, so he ordered Wise's brigade, which was available, to take position on Hunton's left. These tactics were successful. The troops on the federal flank were quickly doubled up and thrown back across a branch of a nearby stream, gravelly run. There the advance had to stop, however, as the Boydton Plank Road and strong federal supports lay just beyond. Lee went with McGowan to the bank of the Little Watercourse, and after examining the terrain he determined to hold it if he could. Dispatching orders to that effect to General Hunton, he tried to get up some artillery and, if possible, some cavalry. Just then, unfortunately, the left of the attacking forces began to waver in the face of a strong federal counterattack. Lee had to consent to a withdrawal which, at the end of the day, brought the troops virtually back where they had been in the morning. On parts of the line to the left of the point from which the advance had been made, brisk skirmishing occurred, but nothing more. Despite the outcome, this valiant fight under his very eyes had a stimulating effect on Lee. When General Hunton returned from the fray his scabbard had been bent almost doubled by a missile and he had three bullet holes through his clothes. Lee greeted him briskly, I wish you would sew those places up, he said. I don't like to see them. General Lee, said Hunton, allow me to go back home and see my wife and I will have them sewed up. The answer amused Lee. The idea, he replied, of talking about going to see wives, it is perfectly ridiculous, sir. Returning to the Turnbull house, Lee reported to the War Department the developments of the day. He had heard nothing from Pickett and Fitz Lee, and apparently he had caught no sound of their fire, but later in the evening he received news of what had befallen them while he had been directing the engagement in front of Anderson's corps. The troops around Five Forks had advanced southward toward Dinwiddie Courthouse, taking the initiative from the enemy. After a hard fight, they had driven back the Federals, who were so numerous that Fitzhugh Lee was satisfied they constituted the whole of the Cavalry Corps. Pushing on, the Confederates had come within about half a mile of the courthouse. Their darkness had halted them, and thence Pickett reported to Lee. The showing of the men had been admirable. There was nothing to suggest either exhaustion or any wavering whatsoever. The good showing made by his gallant old infantry on March 31st did not deceive General Lee. He realized on the morning of April 1st that the situation was increasingly critical, even though his troops had, as yet, been defeated nowhere on the right. 
In one of the last letters ever written in his autograph to the chief executive from the field, he explained the situation to Mr. Davis. By the extension of the federal lines to Dinwiddie Courthouse he was cut off from the depot at Stony Creek, where, he reminded the president, forage for the cavalry had been delivered. It was more difficult to withdraw, for Sheridan's advance had deprived Lee of the use of the White Oak Road, which was one of the most important highways on his right. The enemy was on his flank and potentially in his rear and was in position, with superior cavalry, to cut both the South Side and the Richmond and Danville railroads. This, he said, in my opinion obliged us to prepare for the necessity of evacuating our position on the James River at once, and also to consider the best means of accomplishing it, and our future course. There was no longer any hope, he left Mr. Davis to infer, that time would remain for a slow removal of supplies from Richmond. He would like to have the president's views, he concluded, but felt that his presence at his headquarters was necessary. If the president or the secretary of war could come over for conference, he would be glad. Probably it was soon after he dispatched this letter, it certainly was not before, that Lee received a report from Pickett to the effect that he was being forced to withdraw from the vicinity of Dinwiddie Courthouse. This was bad news. As the Federals were certain to follow Pickett's withdrawal, every step of their advance would bring them toward Five Forks and thence, by what was known as Ford's Road, dangerously close to the Southside Railroad. The whole distance by highway from Dinwiddie Churches to the railway was only seven and one-half miles, less than a day's march, even through such mud as at that season the armies had to encounter. If the railroad was to be saved, Pickett could not afford to give much ground. Lee accordingly wrote Pickett, hold five forks at all hazards. Protect road to Ford's depot and prevent Union forces from striking the South Side Railroad. He added an expression of his regret that Pickett had been compelled to withdraw and could not hold his advantage. The one prospect of saving a desperate situation continued to be the possibility that Grant might in some way expose himself to attack. Lee proceeded to strengthen his position as far as practicable with artillery, on the sound principle that this was the first essential to a possible offensive in case Grant blundered. Pendleton was ordered to bring down to Petersburg a part of the reserve artillery and to dispose it behind the works held by Gordon, whose troops were very close to exhaustion, inasmuch as more than one half of them had to be continuously on duty. Beyond Gordon's flank, a P. Hill, who returned that morning from uncompleted sick leave, resumed command of a corps that was little more than a shadow of itself. All Gordon's troops, plus that part of Hill's forces east of the north and south stretch of Hatcher's Run, now numbered only about 11,000 men. They occupied, it could not be said they held, fully 11 miles of works, from the Appomattox River to Hatcher's Run. Lee knew that this attenuation of his line was a desperate gamble with ruin, especially at a time when Pickett was retreating, and when he received word, early in the day, that troops from the Ziv Corps had been captured, he was quick to act. This corps belonged to Ord's army from the north side of the James, and if the Ziv had been transferred and no other had taken its place, then Longstreet could attack the enemy and force Grant to send troops back to the north side, or else Longstreet could dispatch part of his command to strengthen the Petersburg front. A telegram presenting these alternatives to Longstreet was forwarded immediately. This done and the routine of the morning completed, Lee rode out again to the headquarters of Anderson's corps to watch at first hand the developments there. He found that the troops which had been in Anderson's front the day before had moved to the right, in the direction of General Pickett's front, but, so far as the records show, he heard nothing more from Pickett himself. While at the headquarters of Anderson's corps, Lee received from Longstreet a reply to his telegram concerning the withdrawal of troops from the north side of the James. Longstreet had no sure information, but he was inclined to think the Federals had diminished their force. As he apprehended the federal gunboats could prevent any successful offensive on his part, he thought it better if any troops could be spared to reinforce the south side. Lee answered him with instructions to prepare for a troop movement to the Petersburg front if Longstreet found confirmation of the report that he faced reduced numbers. A little later in the day Lee learned that some of his men had captured federal troopers the contents of whose saddle pockets indicated that Kautz's cavalry was on the south side, would Longstreet ascertain what mounted units were on the north side? Longstreet sent Gary's cavalry to make sure. Old Pete's theory was that as Sheridan's cavalry was worn in Kautz's fresh, Sheridan probably had taken Kautz's and had left some of his tired troops in their place. At four o'clock that afternoon, April 1, heavy firing was heard from the right in the direction of Five Forks. 
Theoretically, a cavalry brigade was in liaison between the Confederate right and the mobile force under Pickett and Fitzhugh Lee. Practically, the mobile force had been cut off from the southern line since it had begun operations. There was, consequently, no knowledge at Anderson's headquarters as to what the sounds of action really meant. It must have been five o'clock and after when a young cavalry captain brought Lee the first intimation of what had happened across the damp, bleak flats among the pines. He was followed by a messenger from Fitz Lee, who reported that the troops had been attacked in great force and that he had lost contact with Pickett. Lee accepted the news as indicating a reverse, but he did not yet know that a dark and humiliating tragedy had been enacted around five forks in these grim stages. Pickett's withdrawal from in front of Dinwiddie Courthouse, ordered for four o'clock, had been begun at daybreak and had been carried out in good order, though followed up very closely by the Federals. The column had been halted, and line of battle had been formed in the position at five forks from which the advance had begun. Fitzlee said in his report that this was done on account of the importance of the location as a point of observation to watch and develop movements then evidently in contemplation for an attack on our left flank or upon the line of railroad communication, but the fact was that Fitzlee thought the Confederate advance had broken up the federal movement, at least temporarily. When he returned to Five Forks, he was not looking for a federal attack that afternoon. Pickett must have been of the same mind, for he went off with Fitz Lee, about the middle of the day, to enjoy a shadbake provided by General Rosser. In their absence, shortly before 3 p.m., Federals were seen making their way toward the Confederate left. Soon they swept overwhelmingly down on the 6,000 infantry, who were badly placed and had very little artillery. Quickly the Union troops turned the left flank of the Confederates and routed or captured a large part of them in a coup de main. The survivors retreated as best they could in the darkness to the South Side Railroad. There they were rallied. Thus, in two calamitous hours, the mobile force that Lee had established to protect his right flank was swept away and virtually ceased to be. The Federals reported the capture of 3,244 men and four guns. The casualties were not large compared with those Lee had sustained in some of his great battles, but they were a very considerable fraction of his diminished army. His most strategic position had been lost. Fought in accordance with the plans made by two subordinates, and without Lee's participation or knowledge of what was happening, Five Forks was only one scene removed from the dread denouement. Chapter 4 The Breaking of the Line Lee heard the first incomplete report of Five Forks stoically on the afternoon of April 1st, and, as was his habit when making his first adjustments to a new situation, in his deep voice he asked abstractedly of the cavalry officer who brought him the news, Well, Captain, what shall we do? The best he could do was little enough, and it entailed new risks, he must reinforce the cavalry with other infantry in place of pickets. At 5.45, Bushrod Johnson was ordered, through Anderson, to proceed at once to Church Crossing, near Fords, and to support the cavalry. Forty-five minutes later Johnson moved with three brigades, Wises, Moody's, and Huntons. This meant the virtual abandonment of that part of the line within the bend of Hatcher's Run. It meant even more, for as the few remaining units were spread out, they were so thinned as almost to be helpless. From Battery Greg to Hatcher's Run the men were from 10 to 20 feet apart, and at some point still farther. A single regiment of Scales's brigade and the sharpshooters of another, McRae's, were all that could be put in the position that Wise's and Hunton's brigades had occupied. Lee's only chance of remaining the endangered, the all but abandoned works on the right was to bring Field's division of 4,600 men from the north side of the James. He now ordered this, most urgently, and directed that Longstreet come with Field's men. In the last struggle, he wanted near him that lieutenant, who, for all his stubborn self-opinion, was the best corps commander he had left. Lee must have put the extremity of his plight into that order, the text of which has been lost, for as it was transmitted through channels, it had an ominous ring. It is important beyond measure, Longstreet's adjutant general wrote Field, that no time be lost. As Field's departure would leave only one division of infantry, a single brigade of cavalry, and some heavy artillery north of the James, the tocsin was sounded in the capital and all the local defense troops, together with the state cadets, were ordered out to man the works below Richmond. Ewell reassumed actively his general command on the north side. Had Lee known early in the evening the full magnitude of the disaster that had befallen Pickett, he might have ordered the evacuation of the Petersburg Line before daylight.
even as it was, with the enemy on his right flank and the river behind him, he must have ridden back to the Turnbull house in full knowledge that what little hope remained to him hung on the arrival of Longstreet before Grant assaulted. As compared with the state of affairs on March 27, here was the situation, in terms of the density of infantry, after fields started to move and the local defense troops took position. Zone and Command Infantry per mile Per kilometer Of defended line April 1, March 27 North of the James Cavalry on the left flank, approximately 500, on March 27, 1800. Kershaw's division, 1800, and 2,200 of Ewell's local defense troops and reservists not previously on the line. 600, 370, 1360, 850. Ewell, with other reservists, on a front of 5 miles, local defense troops and heavy artillerists, on a front of 2.5 miles. 740, 460, 740, 460. Howlett Line. Mahone's Division. 740, 460, 740, 460. From the Appomattox to Lieutenant's Run. Gordon, with Walker's and Evans's divisions. 870, 540, 1350, 840. From Lieutenant's Run to Burgess's Mill. Grimes's Division of Gordon's Corps, 2 miles. 870, 540, 1350, 840. Wilcox's Division of Hill's Corps, 2 and a quarter miles. 1100, 680, 1100, 680. Haight's Division of Hill's Corps, diminished by casualties of March 31, approximately 250, and by McRae's sharpshooters and one regiment of Scaleses. 1565, 970, 1200, 745. Average density of this zone. 1262, 784, 1150, 715. Beyond Burgess's Mill. One regiment of Scales's brigade, McRae's sharpshooters, about 400 men on three-mile front. 133, 83, 1600, 990. Moving April 1st. Anderson, with Wise, Hunton, and Moody, about 3,500 men, to support the cavalry on the right. Fields Division, from the extreme left, about 4,600 men, ordered to Petersburg. Cavalry, north and west of Hatcher's Run, strength and condition unknown the evening of April 1st to Lee. Pickett's Command, a quasi-reserve on March 27th, position and strength unknown to Lee on the evening of April 1st. South of the James River, on nearly 20 miles of line, Lee now had scarcely 16,000 infantry in position and none in reserve. From the Appomattox to Hatcher's Run, he had only 11,000. From Lieutenant's Run, where the works began to be less formidable, to the very end of his fortified position, where the Claiborne Road crossed the western stretch of Hatcher's Run, he had no more than 12,500 infantry. These included the forces in the highly important position of Burgess's Mill. If Grant were held off one day longer, as he had been held off for nine months, there was still a chance of a safe withdrawal and a reconcentration. But if Grant turned the right, or discovered how thin was the line of infantry behind the works then, but Lee could only tell General Grimes, who reported the weakness of his position, that he must do the best he could. His orders given, Lee went to his quarters and partly disrobed, but he slept little, if at all. He was exhausted, though not actually ill. He may have heard the shelling that began at 9 p.m. on Wilcox's front, the nearest point of which was only a little more than two miles from his headquarters. He probably knew nothing of a minor shift of part of McRae's force to the east of Hatcher's Run, next Macomb, where danger seemed to be threatened. Perhaps he caught the sound of the picket firing that broke out at 1.45 on the morning of the fateful 2D of April. Soon a Pete Hill, who had been apprehensive because of the heaviness of the artillery fire, came out from his quarters, which were a mile and a half nearer Petersburg than Lee's. About four o'clock Longstreet arrived in advance of Field's division, which was moving toward the city as rapidly as the creaking wheels of the decrepit railroad could turn.
Li was in bed, still feeling very unwell, but received Longstreet at once and reviewed for him the condition on the right. He directed Longstreet to take his troops, the instant they detrained, and to march for Hatcher's Run. Suddenly, while Lee was explaining the route of the division, Colonel Venable broke excitedly into the room. Wagons and teamsters, he said, were driving wildly down Cox's road toward Petersburg. An infantry officer had told him that federal skirmishers had driven him from Harris's quarters, less than half a mile from Edge Hill. From Harris's quarters? Why, the huts of the Mississippians were a mile and a half in the rear of the main line. If the enemy were there, then the Federals had broken the line, broken it at a point that would put them in rear of the whole of the Confederate right. Instantly the general sprang from his bed and hurried to the front door of the Turnbull house with Longstreet. It was an usually dark morning. Distant objects were vague. But long lines of men, like those of skirmishers, were visible, moving slowly toward Edge Hill from the southwest. Were they retreating Confederates or advancing Union troops? Quick, Colonel Venable, Mount and Reconnoiter, and General Hill, but Hill was already running toward his horse. There must have been something desperate in the manner of Hill, for as the two hurried off, Lee called to Venable to caution Hill not to expose himself. Away they galloped. Other officers leaped into their saddles and sped after them. Couriers lashed their lean and frantic horses as they dashed away with orders. Then, for a few moments, the line that stretched far across the gray fields halted as if in doubt. Anxiously Lee concentrated his gaze on it. Soon, in the growing light, the color of the men's uniforms was visible, blue. They were Federals. Could Longstreet use Field's division to stop them? No, old Pete had to answer, word had not yet come that any of Field's regiments had detrained, much less that they had arrived on the ground. If that were so, the best that could be done for the moment was to rally the Confederate forces on Fort Gregg and Fort Baldwin, south of the Turnbull House and perpendicular to the main east and west line. And as Fort Baldwin was a mile and a quarter from the Appomattox, it was necessary for the troops south of Fort Baldwin and Fort Gregg to withdraw more to the east and to occupy the inner line. In simplest terms, the general situation as then known to General Lee is sketched on page 46. Going back to his private quarters, Lee dressed quickly and prepared to leave the Turnbull House, which was directly in the line of the Federal advance. When he reappeared, he was in full uniform and had on his sword. Quickly he mounted his horse and rode down to the gate of Edge Hill and across the road whence he had a good sweep of the country. He had not been there long, intent with orders for meeting the surprise, when a number of staff officers came up. Some of them were of Hill's entourage, and with them was Hill's dapple gray horse. But the commander of the Third Corps was not astride the animal. Instead, Sergeant G. W. Tucker rode him, Tucker, who was known throughout the army as Hill's daredevil courier, the man who had asked permission in the wilderness campaign to go out to the skirmish line and kill a federal cavalryman in order that he might get a horse to take the place of his own, which was dead. Tucker had no jest in him now, with heavy heart he told how Hill and himself had ridden on, after Colonel Venable had left them, and how they had encountered two federals who had answered their call for surrender with rifle shots. Hill had been hit and had toppled out of his saddle. Tucker had seen him on the ground, motionless, had caught his horse and had changed to it because the gray was fresher than his own mount. Lee listened intently. Grief showed itself in a sharp change of expression. Tears came to his eyes, he is at rest now, he murmured, and we who are left are the ones who suffer. Then he turned to Tucker and directed him to go with Colonel Palmer, Hill's adjutant general, so that Mrs. Hill might know the facts. Colonel, he said to Palmer, break the news to her as gently as possible. To Major General Haight, Hill's senior division commander, Lee dispatched the grim announcement with orders to report at once in person. As it happened, Haight was far down on the right, near Burgess's mill, and found the enemy between him and the headquarters when he attempted to get to the Turnbull house. As he failed to appear, Lee put the Third Corps under Longstreet. After the first eruption of the Federals, there was a period of comparative calm west and southwest of Edge Hill. The tide of blue seemed, indeed, to be receding rather than advancing. It was probably at this time, though it is not certain, that Lee learned what had happened. Further fact, of course, sifted in with the hours.
the Federals had started bombardment during the night and at 4.45 had assaulted along nearly the whole of the line from the Appomattox River on the Confederates' left, far around to the right on Hatcher's Run. The assaults had three aspects. On Gordon's lines, from the river to Fort Gregg, the enemy had gained the first line easily but had there met with resistance of the most stubborn sort. At the very time that Lee was getting information of this, Gordon was counterattacking as vigorously as he had that day at Bloody Angle. On his front, though the Federal advance could of course be pressed till the rear line was overrun, there was no immediate danger. Southwest of Fort Gregg, where the lines turned away toward Hatcher's Run, the assault had a second aspect. Thomas's and Lane's brigades of Wilcox's division, who occupied that part of the front, had simply been overwhelmed. Coming through at a little ravine below the Banks House, opposite the Federal Forts Fisher and Welch, at a point two miles southwest of the Confederate Fort Gregg, the van of the Federals had pushed due north to the Boydton Plank Road and beyond. These were the troops that had first been seen from Lee's headquarters. Two soldiers had actually gone half a mile farther to the Southside Railroad, where they had torn up a couple of rails. Most of Lane's and Thomas's men, and a few from Haight's division, falling back in front of the Federals and counterattacking more than once, had been ordered by General Wilcox toward Fort Gregg. Some of them had gone the opposite way, toward the right. The Federals had turned in that direction much more heavily than to the Confederate left center and were sweeping down the Boydton Plank Road and along the works towards Hatcher's Run. Near that stream, the assault took on its third aspect. The fog had hung heavily along the run and had prevented a frontal assault at 4.45. After 7 o'clock this fog had lifted and the Federals had gone forward. They first reached the line at a point about three miles southwest of the other break and just to the east of Hatcher's run at the first crossing of the Confederate lines over that stream. The Federals met with little resistance here and captured Davis's brigade and part of Macomb's, both of Haight's division. The Confederates around Burgess's mill, on the other side of Hatcher's Run, got away, Cooks, Scaleses, McGowan's, and a part of McRae's brigades. They marched northward to the Southside Railroad at Sutherland Station, whither Anderson had gone and where Pickett had orders to join him. The Federals who had turned toward the Confederate right, after the breakthrough on Lane's front at the Banks House, soon met those who had marched into the Confederate works on Hatcher's Run. There was a halt as the lines were reformed. Then a large part of the combined forces turned back toward Petersburg. Lee did not have all this detail in the early morning, but he knew that the troops on Hatcher's Run were cut off from him, and he could see that beyond the right of Fort Gregg he practically had no line. About the same time, presumably, Lee got his first full news of the magnitude of the disaster to picket the previous evening, though he had heard from the cavalry and knew something of it. Calamity was piled on disaster. Lee's situation now presented two obvious problems. One was to hold Petersburg until night and then to get out with the troops still on the lines. The other problem was to effect a new concentration with the forces cut off on the right, which forces he could not now help in their efforts to escape. He was not certain, shortly after 10 o'clock, that he would be able to maintain his position until night and he saw no prospect of doing more, but he determined, if he could hold out that long, to evacuate the whole front as soon as darkness fell and to reconcentrate on the Richmond and Danville Railroad. In a few minutes of relative quiet he dictated to his adjutant general a telegram for the Secretary of War, reviewing the facts, outlining his plan, and concluding significantly, I advise that all preparation be made for leaving Richmond tonight. I will advise you later, according to circumstances." Taylor in his turn, probably from his rough notes, dictated this fateful message to the telegram operator, who sent it directly to the War Department in Richmond, where it was received at 10.40. This was the dispatch that was carried to President Davis in St. Paul's Church, Richmond, during the morning service. He read it, got up quietly, and left the building. About the time Lee sent this warning to the president, General Gordon forwarded a report of conditions on his front. He had met the enemy's assaults with local counterattacks, he said, and was preparing a larger operation. As this would be costly of life, he asked whether General Lee's future movements depended on the recapture of his original line. Lee sent back answer that the enemy's gains on the right would necessitate a withdrawal and that Gordon should sacrifice no more men needlessly but should close the breach the Federals had made in his line and should be prepared to quit at nightfall. Thus far Lee had maintained his equanimity. 
when a staff officer came up, asked some question of one of his subordinates, and formally saluted the general, Lee raised his hat in acknowledgement and gave the answer in a voice entirely measured and composed. He was self-contained and serene, wrote Colonel Taylor, and he acted as one who was conscious of having accomplished all that was possible in the line of duty and who was undisturbed by the adverse conditions in which he found himself. New tests of his self-control lay ahead, for the Federals, who had been inactive and had almost disappeared after their first rush toward the Turnbull House, began to move forward again. Their evident purpose was to storm or mask Fort Gregg and Fort Baldwin and to close in north of these works, past Lee's headquarters, to the Appomattox River. Shell began to come over. One of them went through the house itself. Federal infantry were massing. Assaults were brewing. Guns that Lee had ordered down from the Howlett line the previous day had gone into action nearby, some of them in the garden of the Turnbull house. They were served under Lee's eye in a manner to win the enemy's praise, and they seemed to hold up the federal flanking movement. Soon Taylor and the telegraph operator were leaving the house. Musketry fire was mingling with the shell. Even the artillery was about to withdraw. Lee himself must turn his back on the enemy and go within the inner lines. Carefully sending away a chair he had borrowed, and manifestly unwilling to start, he remained until the enemy was so close that Traveller had to be put to a gallop. This is a bad business, Colonel, he said to one of his staff, in a tone still untroubled. Ere long the Turnbull house was aflame, by design, he thought, and much to his regret. A little way, and he reigned in his grey, but evidently his cavalcade had been seen and recognized, for the Federals pursued it with a hot fire. Soon a shell exploded only a few feet behind, killed a horse and scattered fragments. Lee's face became flushed as it did when he was angry, he turned his head over his right shoulder, and his eyes were gleaming. He wanted to charge his pursuers, but he quickly recovered himself and rode through the inner line, where a thin, scratch force received him with cheers as warm as those of that great high noon of his glory at Chancellorsville. Well, Colonel, he is said, perhaps apocryphally, to have told one of his officers, it has happened as I told them it would at Richmond. The line has been stretched until it has broken. Now came one of the most dramatic incidents of an overwhelming day. Some 400 to 600 troops of Wilcox's division and of Harris's brigade, men who had previously been rallied and employed in counterattacks that had delayed the enemy's advance, were put into Fort Gregg and were told to hold it to the last extremity. They made a Homeric defense. Using their few field guns as long as they could, they then employed their muskets, and in the final assault at one o'clock, their bayonets. Against them was directed a full division. At one time, in the hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the parapet, six federal flags were to be counted. And still the fighting continued. At length, the little battery was entirely surrounded, and from the loopholes in the palisades enclosing the gorge a spirited and telling fire was delivered upon the enemy at short range, after the complete surrounding of the battery, the struggle continued fifteen or twenty minutes. When the Federals at last entered Fort Gregg, they found fifty-five dead and took about three hundred prisoners, including the wounded. Just before the attack on Fort Gregg began, Benning's brigade, which was the Van of Fields Division, reported to Longstreet and was put into fill a gap on the Confederate right, between Fort Baldwin and the Appomattox River. Along with the men already on the line, they fought desperately but against such heavy odds that their officers kept calling for reinforcements. Lee had each time to send the same answer, that he had none. Finally, when Colonel Palmer came up from Longstreet and asked for the troops to be employed around Battery 45, Lee's patience failed him. He was standing at the time on the bluff above Town Creek, in the thickest of the fire, near the Whitworth house, but, as always, he seemed oblivious to the danger. I have received that message several times, he said to Palmer, and I have no troops to send. Palmer saluted formally. I cannot help it, General, how often you have heard it, I am compelled to deliver you General Longstreet's message." Lee's manner softened, but his necessity continued. The men must fight it out where they were. And they did. Shortly thereafter a broken line was taken up in rear of the forts from Battery 45 to the Appomattox. This line was stabilized during the early afternoon.
As soon as he was reasonably sure that he could hold Petersburg until nightfall, Lee went to the McKilwain or Dupuy house, one mile from the city, and proceeded to arrange the details of the evacuation. This was a more difficult task than the withdrawal from Maryland in 1862 or the retreat after Gettysburg owing to the condition of the men, of the animals, and of the roads, and to the necessity of destroying many supplies and guns that could not be moved. The march was to be directed to Buckville, and the point of reconcentration was to be Amelia Courthouse, a village distant 40 miles from Petersburg, on the railroad from Richmond to Danville. A retreat to Amelia meant that all the units except Anderson's Corps and Mahon's division would have to make two crossings of a river, with all the encumbrance of their heavy wagon trains. The reservists and those of Longstreet's troops left on the north side of the James must pass over that river and then over the north and south stretch of the Appomattox, just east of Amelia Courthouse. The divisions from Petersburg had to get north of the Appomattox and, turning westward, had to negotiate that stream again. Anderson's corps could strike out up the south bank of the Appomattox and could reach Amelia Courthouse without crossing the river. The roads from the different parts of the line to Amelia Courthouse had been studied by Lee's engineers, and the condition of the bridges, as already noted, had been reported as of March 30. The task of the staff was primarily that of routing the commands so as to minimize congestion on any particular road. Of three spans on the upper Appomattox, Goods and Bevilles were passable. The state of the third, that at Genado, being in doubt, Lee ordered pontoons sent to Matokes by railroad. Thence engineers were to transport them to Genado Bridge and were to put them down so that the wagon train from Richmond could pass. Orders were to destroy all bridges after the last Confederate forces had crossed. In the case of Ewell, who would be in charge of all the troops leaving Richmond, supplementary instructions were given to avoid any alarm of preparation in the capital. The evacuation of Petersburg was to begin immediately after dark. All guns were to be out of the works in front of that city by 8 o'clock and were to be across the Appomattox by 3 a.m. The special orders were issued as rapidly as possible. The general order was drafted more slowly and was revised with some care, though not materially changed. Its composition was interrupted by many calls for counsel and direction. Mr. Davis, going from the church to the War Department, telegraphed that a move from Richmond that night would involve the loss of many valuables, both for the want of time to pack and of transportation. It was a plain request for more time, despite warnings repeatedly given since February 21. Lee's nerves were beginning to feel the strain of a day in purgatory, and when he read the President's message he tore it into bits. I am sure I gave him sufficient notice, he said, but he replied calmly that it was absolutely necessary to abandon the position that night. Lee thought at the time that the president would go with the army and he made arrangement to acquaint him with the route and to supply him with a guide. Rumors of the proposed move were getting afoot. The naval commander at Drury's Bluff had heard of the stir among the infantry, and as he had no orders from his department, he asked for suggestions through Mahone, who held the adjacent lines. From the Bureau of Subsistence in Richmond came an inquiry to Colonel Cole as to the proper route for the reserve rations that had been accumulated. Lee probably never saw this message. Soon there came the mayor and two members of the Petersburg City Council to inquire what was to be done and what action they should take. Lee found them at the house when he returned from a brief absence, and he took pains to say nothing that would create needless panic in the town. With polite reticence he said he would communicate with them officially at 10 p.m. reminders there were, in the midst of it all, that Petersburg was not the only city in anguish. From Lt. Gen. Taylor in Alabama, Lee received telegrams predicting the fall of Mobile. Another message now from the President, would the Danville Railroad be safe that night? Lee thought so and notified him it could be used until the next day. The admission was gloomy, but so was the situation, yet Lee did not abate his efforts. Receiving a letter of the previous day from Mr. Davis, he found time at three o'clock to dictate an immediate reply, in which he discussed plans for raising Negro troops, as if the war would go on indefinitely. In a later paragraph he told what had happened and explained, I do not see how I can possibly help withdrawing from the city to the north side of the Appomattox tonight.
he concluded characteristically, I regret to be obliged to write such a hurried letter to your excellency, but I am in the presence of the enemy, endeavoring to resist his advance, as though the exactions of the greatest crisis in the army on which his government depended for its existence would not have excused sentences far more disjointed than his calm lines. He was full of courtesy still, and still full of fight. The afternoon was passing. Duties for the desperate night had to be apportioned. Lee called his entire staff together, explained the plans for the evacuation, and assigned to each his work. There was one staff officer, however, who had plans of his own for the evening. That was Colonel Walter Taylor. He worked furiously until the last orders were out and awaiting execution. Then he came to Lee and preferred as strange a request as ever adjutant general put forward on the day of a general troop movement, would the general excuse him that evening and permit him to go over to Richmond? He would overtake the army early in the morning, but tonight, tonight he wanted to get married. He explained that the home of his affianced was within the enemy's lines and that she was alone in Richmond, working in one of the government offices, and wished to follow the fortunes of the Confederacy if the front should be restored farther south. Thereupon General Lee, said Taylor, promptly gave his assent. Thus it came about that on the night when the whole army was to move, and over strange roads, Lee acted as his own adjutant general. When the dreadful day ended the lines were still holding. The enemy's attacks had died away, as if Grant knew that the morning would yield him the city without the shedding of more blood. Lee sent the last word to the War Department, it is absolutely necessary that we abandon our position tonight or run the risk of being cut off in the morning. I have given all the orders to officers on both sides of the river and have taken every precaution that I can to make the movement successful. It will be a difficult operation, but I hope not impracticable. In the spirit of that final statement, soon after night fell, the troops began quietly to move out of the city. Lee mounted Traveler and passed over the bridge to the north side of the Appomattox for the last time as a soldier. He was next to see Petersburg as a silent guest at a wedding party, in the midst of gaiety depressed by the memories of a suffering city, of a starving army, and of a dying cause. His heart was heavy but his manner was calm as he rode to the mouth of the Hickory Road, where Gordon was to take the right fork and Longstreet the left if they slipped successfully away from their positions. Lee drew rein between the forks and in person superintended the movement. In darkness, the columns pressed on, with no drum for their step, no word from the sergeants. Their march was to the growl of the Federal guns on the lines and to the groan of heavily laden wagons. The different commands could not be distinguished in the blackness. Pickett was not there, nor Johnson's division, nor Kershaw's, nor more than a fragment of Haight's or of Wilcox's. Mahone was moving by a different road. But the ghosts of others walked the night, Perry's Alabamians, Benning's Georgians, and that glorious old Texas brigade that Hood and then Gregg had commanded. There was the remnant of Rhodes's division and there the wreck of Early's, with what was left of the renowned Stonewall Brigade. Lee waited till the rear was well closed up before he rode on. Chapter 5 The Threat of Starvation when he evacuated Petersburg on the night of April 2, 1865, Lee had with him probably not more than 12,500 infantry, fewer men than in any of the five Federal Corps on the south side of the James, and on the whole of the front he had only from 28,000 to 30,000 infantry moving or preparing to move. After the heavy losses on the right on April 1, and the casualties sustained in the Federal assault of April 2, he could not have mustered even that number had not the local defense troops and many of the detailed men and convalescents quit Richmond and joined in the retreat. Not all of these, of course, were efficient troops. Nor, for that matter, could all the units of the veteran army itself be accounted fit. Wilcox's and Haight's divisions, two of the largest in the army, had been shattered and divided. Pickett's had almost ceased to exist. Johnson's was worn by long service in the trenches. For stiff fighting the next day, in case he was immediately pursued, Lee could have relied only on Field's division of Longstreet's corps and on Gordon's small and weary corps. Of the troops ordered to join Lee at Amelia Courthouse from quiet sectors, two divisions and no more than two, Mahones and Kershaw's, were in good condition, and Kershaw's was very thin. Nearly all the cavalry were close to exhaustion and were still detached. The only exception was Gary's small brigade which was to accompany the infantry from the north side of James River.
The artillery counted about 200 guns, some of them on weak carriages, pulled by feeble horses in rotten harness. The wagons exceeded 1,000, most of them with four animals. When the trains were fully spread out they occupied 30 miles of road, heavy impedimenta for an army whose escape required speed. Despite all this, the start was auspicious. After day broke on April 3rd and the men had been rested by the roadside, a curious spirit, half of elation, spread down the ranks. Lee himself is credited, though not on specific authority, with saying, I have got my army safe out of its breastworks, and in order to follow me, the enemy must abandon his lines and can derive no further benefit from his railroads or James River. He appeared to be relieved that he was on open ground again and he seemed confident he would be able to reach Johnston. Everything, however, depended on a speedy and uninterrupted retreat. The infantry, having subsisted on the meagerest of rations while remaining for the most part in fixed positions, could not endure fighting by day and marching by night. The teams would soon break down on the muddy roads. There was nothing on the first day to indicate a rapid or vigorous pursuit, but if that lead of one day were lost all might be lost for it was now more manifest than ever that when Grant found the direction of the army's retreat and set out after Lee, all the advantage would be with the Federals. Lee's route above the Appomattox was westerly, but it was twenty degrees farther north than was that of Grant, moving below the river. Lee's immediate objective, Amelia Courthouse, could be reached before Grant could overtake him, but beyond Amelia, Lee's road turned to the southwest, down the Richmond and Danville Railroad, and crossed the low trajectory of Grant's march. From Petersburg to Bookville, the junction of the South Side and of the Richmond and Danville Railroads, the distance Lee had to cover was 55 miles, by way of Goods Bridge. Grant's route from Sutherland Station to Bookville, via the Namazine Road, was 36 miles, 19 miles shorter than Lee's. That is to say, Lee operated on the arc and Grant on the cord, Lee had to follow the dotted and Grant the black line, as shown on page 60. Lee's total distance to the Roanoke River, the nearest point where he could hope to meet Johnston, was 107 miles. Grant's was 88. In the knowledge that the time factor would settle the campaign, and with the campaign the war, Lee urged the troops to their best effort. He was in the vicinity of Summit when a message arrived from Judge James H. Cox of Clover Hill inviting Lee and Longstreet and their staff officers to dine with them. Men who had subsisted for weeks on the stern fare of the trenches were delighted at this prospect of enjoying the hospitality of a Virginia home of distinction, and they gladly rode over to Clover Hill through a mile of woods. The house was crowded with guests and, despite the excitement of the retreat, the place took on a festive air for an hour. When the mint juleps were served, the general barely touched his and enjoyed, instead, a glass of ice water. Do you know, he said to Miss Kate Cox, the daughter of the house, that this glass of cold water is, I believe, far more refreshing than the drinks that they are enjoying so much? Soon, of course, the conversation centered on the movement of the army. General Lee, said Miss Cox, we shall still gain our cause, you will join General Johnston and together you will be victorious. Whatever happens, Lee answered quietly, know this, that no men ever fought better than those who have stood by me. Miss Kate had been assigned to sit by Longstreet and to help him cut his food, for he was still unable to use his right arm, but when dinner was announced Lee insisted that she stay by his side. As coffee was passed at the close of the meal, Lee put cream in his. General Lee, said the vivacious Miss Kate, do you take cream in your after-dinner coffee? The weary soldier smiled. I have not taken coffee for so long that I would not dare to take it in its original strength. Kate understood this better when one of the staff confided to her that Lee sent all his coffee to the hospitals. Soon, of course, the officers of the little cavalcade had to turn their backs on the pleasant Cox home and rejoin the long line of ragged men streaming westward through the spring mud. Already, Lee found, some of the half-starved teams were collapsing as they tried to pull the heavy ordnance wagons. Men too weak to keep up with the column were beginning to straggle. Then the discovery was made that the high water had covered the approaches to Beville's Bridge over the Appomattox, 25 miles northwest of Petersburg. This was not a light matter. For Beville's was the nearest of the three bridges across the north and south stretch of the Appomattox on the roads to Amelia. Longstreet's and Gordon's troops had been ordered to use this bridge, while Mahone, his train, and Gordon's wagons crossed at Goods, the next span up the river.
Ewell and the men from Richmond, according to the plan, were to have their pontoons at Genito Crossing, two miles and a half above the railroad trestle at Matokes. With Beville's Bridge impassable, Longstreet and Gordon had to be rerouted via goods. This taxed that bridge and caused congestion and delay which were increased as the fall of the floodwaters lowered the pontoons and made it necessary for the engineers to readjust the approaches. To make a bad condition worse, Lee learned, late in the afternoon, from a Mr. Haxel, who lived near Goods Bridge, that pontoons had not been laid at Genito. It developed that the Engineer Bureau had not dispatched the boats to Matokes as directed. Ewell's men were moving toward a stream they could not cross. Lee had to dispatch a courier to Ewell to acquaint him with the facts and to instruct him, if he could do no better, to move down to Goods Bridge and use that. The situation is set out graphically in the sketch on this page. By nightfall on the 3D the troops from Petersburg had covered an average of not less than 21 miles. Longstreet had crossed Fields and Wilcox's men over the Appomattox at Goods and had taken up a line to the west of the bridge in order to cover the passage of the wagons and of the artillery. Gordon, who was behind Longstreet, acted as rear guard of the principal column the next day and the next. Mahone had left the Howlett line a little before daylight on the 3D and was well on the road to Goods Bridge. Lee had heard nothing from Ewell, who was supposed to be marching to Genital Bridge with Custis Lee's command and Kershaw's division. It is doubtful whether Lee had seen against the sky any reflection of the great fire that had been starting in Richmond as Kershaw moved out. He certainly did not know though of course he assumed that the Federals that morning had reached the objective of nearly four years fighting and had entered the capital city. Anderson by this time, the night of the 3D, had approached Beville's Bridge. Then Lee learned through an exhausted staff officer the confused story of what had happened on the extreme right after the line had been broken early on the morning of the 2D. In obedience to orders, after Pickett had been defeated at Five Forks, Anderson had started about dark on April 1 to go to Church Crossing, near Ford Station on the Southside Railroad, to support the cavalry. Meantime, after the battle, what was left of Pickett's command, nearly all of it had been captured, had found its way to the Southside Railroad, whence it proceeded to Exeter Mills in the hope of crossing the Appomattox and rejoining the army. At the mills, Pickett had found no bridge and had discovered that the river was too high to be forded. Anderson had reached Church Crossing at 2 a.m. on the morning of April 2 and had formed a junction with Fitzlee's cavalry but had received no word of Pickett. Couriers were dispatched to find Pickett and to give him orders to report to Anderson. Pickett was duly located very early in the morning of April 2 and he set out to march to Anderson, but he had not gone far before he met stragglers from Hates and Wilcox's divisions. These men, who had been forced from the line in the Federal assault on the morning of April 2, had been turned to the Confederate right while the rest of their commands had been driven toward the left, that is, toward Fort Gregg. Pickett subsequently stated that he ascertained from these men what had happened and that he decided to continue up the river and join Anderson, who, as he learned, was moving toward Amelia Courthouse. So Pickett changed his route and carried the debris of his command farther up the south bank of the Appomattox. That night, April 2, Hunton's brigade, which had been having hard fighting, rejoined Pickett. Anderson, for his part, on the morning of that same fateful 2D of April, found only a strong cavalry force in front of his infantry and of Fitzhugh Lee's command. But the horses of the Confederate troopers were so weary, and the men were so tired, that he did not consider it wise to take the offensive until soldiers and mounts had rested. While he was waiting, information of the disaster at Petersburg reached him. Later he got orders to retire behind the Appomattox at Bevilles, which was the nearest bridge across that stream. On the 3D, accompanied by the cavalry, Anderson began to carry out these orders and, after a day of many disturbances, reached the vicinity of Bevilles Bridge. There he caught up with Pickett. During the time Pickett was marching up the Appomattox on the 2D, while Anderson was resting at Church Crossing, preparatory to a similar move, the broken parts of Wilcox's and Haight's divisions, McGowan's, Scales's, McRae's, and perhaps some of Macomb's stragglers, got together under General Haight at Sutherland's Tavern. They numbered about 1,200 muskets and they proceeded to construct a hasty line by piling up fence rails. Two attacks they succeeded in beating off, but when the enemy turned their left flank and got in their rear they had to retreat hurriedly. Many were captured, a remnant got across the river.
They kept moving, at intervals, until the night of the 3D, when they rejoined their divisions at Goods Bridge. Although there thus were three points of concentration, Church Crossing, Sutherland's Tavern, and Exeter Mills, Anderson, who had nearly all the cavalry of the army with him, could not get the troops together. Each command fought or marched alone, in an effort to escape. But now, at last, on the night of the 3D, Lee was in touch with all the units that had made their way from the Petersburg line, and he had no reason to suppose the forces from the Richmond and Howlett lines would not speedily overtake him. It looked as if the reconcentration would be effected at Amelia Courthouse, with no further losses. About seven o'clock the next morning, April 4, Lee learned that the courier who had been sent to Ewell with orders the previous evening had come back and had reported that he had not been able to hear anything of the troops moving from Richmond. Lee did not know what this implied, so he sent the dispatch off again with a postscript in which he gave Ewell discretionary orders to cross the river where he could and to move as soon as practicable to Amelia Courthouse. To cover the possibility that Ewell might be compelled to use Goods Bridge, Lee directed that Mahone's division should remain there and should prevent the crossing until it was known that Ewell was over the Appomattox. After Longstreet passed the rest of his command over Goods Bridge, early in the morning of the 4th, he soon met enemy cavalry. Contact meant, of course, that Grant would speedily be apprised of the army's position. Indeed, he might already have learned it. Skirmishing began and continued intermittently on the left flank as the column moved toward Amelia Courthouse eight and a half miles away. Lee himself crossed the stream shortly after 7.30. Near the bridge a young staff officer came up on his horse to report his command in good condition and awaiting orders. Lee heard him through and then, looking straight at him, asked, Did those people surprise your command this morning? The staff officer, much astonished, answered in the negative and inquired if General Lee had received any such report. The general answered that he had not, but that, judging from appearances, something urgent had kept the young men around headquarters from making their toilet, so he thought perhaps they had been surprised. Then he pointed to the officer's boots. On one leg the trousers were stuffed hastily into the boot. On the other they were outside. The youngster had been unconscious of this and, when he looked, he blushed shamefacedly, took his rebuke in silence, saluted, and started to ride off. Seeing the officer's mortification, Lee called him back and told him that he only intended to remind him that on a retreat those who were near the commanders must take particular care to avoid anything that looked like demoralization. General Lee then rode on with the advance of Longstreet's corps. Gordon's veterans followed. The troops had now been out of the trenches 36 hours, with their wagon train strung out on the muddy roads behind them. The little bread and meat they chanced to have with them at the time of the federal onslaught of the 2D had been consumed. The men were hungry, and for such long marches as they were expected to make they needed ample food. That had been anticipated in advance of the retreat. The commissary general had carried out his instructions to collect a special reserve of rations in Richmond and had accumulated some 350,000 there. Lee's expectation was to supply the troops from this reserve as the men arrived at Amelia Courthouse. Then he expected to move directly down the railroad toward Danville. At other points on the railway, as he advanced, additional supplies were to be sent him. Having changed his base to Danville, he reasoned that, as he marched, his line of communications would be shortened hourly. On reaching Amelia Courthouse, during the morning of April 4, still with the van of Longstreet's corps, Lee's first thought was for the commissary stores. He found ordnance supplies in abundance, 96 full caissons, 200 boxes of artillery ammunition, and 164 boxes of artillery harness, but no food. More than 30,000 hungry men were moving on a village where there was not an army ration. This meant, at the least, a full day's delay, for the army must be fed, and the only way to do this was to halt the march, send out the wagons into the impoverished country roundabout, and impress what could be found. And a day's delay entailed the loss of the army's advantage in time. Even that might not be all. For if the enemy should come up during the night and cut the railroad ahead of the army, where could rations be found for the next day, or the next? The possibilities alarmed Lee as had nothing that had occurred up to that time on the retreat. His anxiety showed itself in his face. He began to look haggard, though his general bearing was as calm and, to some eyes, as confident as ever.
It was, of course, no easy task to disentangle wagons from the train and to send them out foraging over roads about which the Teamsters knew nothing, but this was done at once. Lee in person addressed to the planters of the surrounding country an appeal for help in these terms. Amelia C. H., April 4, 1865. To the citizens of Amelia County, VA. The Army of Northern Virginia arrived here today, expecting to find plenty of provisions, which had been ordered to be placed here by the railroad several days since, but to my surprise and regret I find not a pound of subsistence for man or horse. I must therefore appeal to your generosity and charity to supply as far as each one is able the wants of the brave soldiers who have battled for your liberty for four years. We require meat, beef, cattle, sheep, hogs, flour, meal, corn, and provender in any quantity that can be spared. The quartermaster of the army will visit you and make arrangements to pay for what he receives or give the proper vouchers or certificates. I feel assured that all will give to the extent of their means. R. E. Lee, General The only other thing Lee could do immediately to procure food was to order supplies sent up the Richmond and Danville Railroad from Danville. A dispatch directing the immediate shipment of 200,000 rations to Amelia was sent by Colonel Cole for transmission from Jetersville, seven miles below Amelia. Some of the troops were silent and depressed when they received no rations, but in the Second Corps they still had heart enough to cheer Lee when he passed. The veterans, in the main, were as cheerful as of yore. They still, as one observer testified of those he saw, were in excellent morale and had never been readier for desperate fighting than at that moment. Men and officers were tired and hungry, but laughing, and nowhere could be seen a particle of gloom, of shrinking, or ill-humor, sure symptoms in the human animal of a want of heart of hope. Proud as Lee must have been of the spirit his men displayed, he knew that it could not long be sustained in the face of continued hunger and attack. He must recover as many hours as he might of the day's lead he was losing. This could be done only by rapid marching. And rapid marching could be made possible, if possible at all, only by a reduction of the wagon train and artillery which had encumbered the road and had slowed down the retreat while calling for the detachment of heavy guards. So, during the morning of the 4th, General Pendleton was set to work bringing down the artillery to the needs of the army, and Colonel Corley was directed to do the same thing with the wagons. The excess animals were to be used to help those that remained with the trains. The surplus guns were to be moved by rail to Danville, if practicable. The wagons that were not required with the troops were to be sent around the army in such a way that, though they would have a longer route, the army would be between them and the Federals. Lee's own road was to be southwest, along the railroad. The wagons were to cross the railroad, strike west, and then, at a safe distance, turn south. The soldiers, in other words, were to follow the hypotenuse to the acute angle at Danville, while the wagons were to go around the right angle. In case the artillery could not be sent by rail, it was to follow the route of the wagon trains. This seemed the safest course to follow and the only one that gave any promise of speeding up the movement of the army. While this work was being done, during the forenoon of the 4th, Hill's corps was arriving at Amelia. Wilcox's division reported at 1 o'clock. Some units of Haight's division were up by 4 p.m., among them McRae's brigade, now reduced to about 150 men. Gordon was halted at Scott's shop, about five miles from Amelia. Mahone was still at Good's Bridge waiting for Ewell. Anderson and most of the cavalry, harried by skirmishing, were marching up from the southeast and at nightfall would be about five miles distant. Some of the mounted units were beginning to put in an appearance at Amelia. Only the position of the troops from Richmond remained in doubt. They had now been on the road nearly two days and had not reported. But the enemy was advancing, too. That was as ominous as the lack of provisions. South of the railroad and beyond Amelia, on the way to Bookville, the Federal cavalry were to be seen. Longstreet moved out Field, Wilcox, and Haight and attempted to bring on a fight, but he found the Unionists wary. Lee, himself, anxious to know the strength of the Bluecoats, set out to reconnoiter behind the 14th Virginia Cavalry of Rooney Lee's division. He went some distance down the Avery Church Road and soon found himself where the regiment was skirmishing with a Federal mounted outpost. Just as he rode up, the Federals dashed up and were met with a countercharge.
Probably before he realized it, the general was spurring fast toward the approaching squadrons. Most of the Federals veered off after an exchange of shots, but one of them rode straight on. In an instant, three or four pistols were turned on him. Lee divined what had happened. Don't shoot, he cried out. The men heard him and lowered their weapons. One of them caught the Federal's bridle and brought the horse to a halt. Then they saw what had prompted Lee to give the order, the Federal was wounded and unable to control his runaway mount. At nightfall, the Federals withdrew from in front of Amelia, and Longstreet's troops were able to leave their line of battle. But there was rest neither of mind nor of body for Lee. His tents were pitched in the large yard of a house occupied temporarily by Mrs. Frances L. Smith, a refugee from Alexandria, whose husband was one of General Lee's countless kinsmen. It was a quiet place of trees and grass, and at another time it would have been a pleasant campsite. As it was, Lee was busy with troop dispositions and was wretched over the hunger of his men. Always sensitive to their suffering, he must have been tortured to know that after struggling for two days through the mud on a march of from 35 to 40 miles, they should have to sleep on empty stomachs and with no assurance of food on the morrow. Now, at last, came word from Ewell. He had reached the Appomattox and had found no bridge on his designated route, but he had gone to Matokes and reported from that point, telling General Lee that the engineers were planking the railroad bridge so that he could cross there. Lee answered with instructions and encouragement. He surmised that Ewell would have passed the stream by the time he wrote, 9 p.m., and in this he was not greatly mistaken. Kershaw of Longstreet's corps and the scratch division of Custis Lee, 6,000 men altogether, were behind the Appomattox by night. Mahone, who had been holding the bridge at Goods, passed over also and set out for Amelia. In anticipation of the approach of Ewell's wagon train, which was moving by a roundabout road, Lee at eleven o'clock issued orders for it to follow some of the roads designated for the first stages of the movement of the surplus wagons and artillery on the right of the Richmond and Danville Railroad. This general route was prescribed for the wagon train of Mahone and of the rest of the Third Corps. The situation, then, at the end of a torturing day was this, the reconcentration was nearly complete, but it was bringing more men together where no food was available. If the troops were to be fed at all, it was from what the wagons could collect in the adjacent country and from what might be sent from Danville in answer to Cole's telegram. Should food be forthcoming on the morrow, then the army could move down the railroad and, being no longer slowed down by so large a wagon train, might regain some of the time it had lost in seeking provisions around Amelia. Still again, if they had good fortune, the excess wagons and artillery on the right of the railroad might reach their destination unharmed. There were many ifs, however, and nearly all of them were contingent on the enemy's movements. Those movements, as yet, had disclosed nothing more formidable than cavalry that had disappeared when darkness came. Although the odds were all against Lee, there was still a chance of escape, twenty-four hours would dim it or bring it nearer reality. The Staunton River, a strong line, was distant only four days' forced marching, and beyond it lay Danville, where a million and a half rations were stored. On the morning of April 5, a showery, unhappy day, the wagons began to come in from foraging. One glance at them told the tale, they were almost empty. The farmers had scarcely anything to give or to sell. The county had already been stripped of food and of provender. It was worse than a disappointment, it was a catastrophe. Often, the loyal old army had been hungry, but now starvation seemed a stark reality. Wet and gloomy, the men were slow to take their places in the ranks and to test what was, perhaps, their last hope, that of marching down the road far enough to find the provisions that had been ordered from Danville. At length, the surplus artillery and the wagons were started on their roundabout way to Danville, west of the railroad and beyond the right flank of the army. The caissons and boxes of shells that had been found at Amelia were destroyed, except such as could be used to renew the supply of guns with the troops. The trains of most of the infantry were also sent to the right and, as planned, were to move on a narrower arc than the other vehicles. W. H. F. Lee's cavalry division, which had come up, was dispatched down the railroad. Gary's brigade was ordered to protect the wagon train. Gordon's infantry were to continue to cover the rear. Then Longstreet began to move southwestward, behind a cavalry screen, toward Jetersville and Buckville, the road of escape to Danville.
he was followed by Mahone and presumably by Pickett. After them marched the rest of Anderson's troops, who had now arrived. While the column was extended, Ewell reported with Kershaw and Custis Lee from Richmond. He was put in rear of Anderson but did not move until later in the day. These troops of Ewell's had outmarched their wagon train, which had contained 20,000 good rations for Custis Lee's division. The men did not know it until the next day, if then, but that precious wagon train, when within four miles of Amelia, was struck by Federal cavalry and destroyed. Before these dispositions for the march down the railroad were made, rumors came that the vehicles to the westward had been attacked, bad news, if true, for it meant that the Federal cavalry had crossed the railroad ahead of the Confederate infantry and had worked their way well around to the right flank. Fitz Lee reported after these rumors reached headquarters at Amelia. He had not seen his uncle since the morning of March 29, at Petersburg, and he had lost many troopers meanwhile. But this was no time for reminiscence or explanation. He was ordered to take his own division and Rosser's and to proceed at once in the direction of Painesville, near which the wagon train was supposed to be moving. General Lee kept his headquarters at Amelia until the infantry were well on the road toward Jetersville, the next station beyond Amelia on the Richmond and Danville Railroad. From the village he may have heard the sound of the skirmishing that marked the advance. About 1 p.m. he rode forward with Longstreet and at a distance of about seven miles from Amelia came upon the enemy, entrenching on a well-chosen position. The Federals had overtaken Lee. The road of the army's escape was blocked. Chapter 6. Has the army been dissolved? Often enough, before that 5th of April, 1865, the advance of the Army of Northern Virginia had been halted and word had been sent back that the enemy was at bay. This time Lee was the pursued and not the pursuer. Unless the federal position could be quickly forced or turned, the hope of getting supplies from Danville was at an end, and that, in the desperate situation of the retreating forces, might mean an overwhelming disaster with results too horrible to contemplate. Hastening to the front as soon as he received report of the enemy's presence, Lee found his son Rooney on the ground, with some information as to federal forces. They were Sheridan's men, the cavalrymen reported, how Lee's weary heart must have sunk at the words, and infantry were close by, moving in the general direction of Bookville. Grim-faced and silent, Lee made a reconnaissance of the federal position, made it carefully and slowly as was required, where so much depended upon the decision. He called in the farmers from the neighborhood and talked to them of the country ahead, but he found they knew little of it. Should he try once more the antique valor of his infantry, as he had at 2nd Manassas and at Chancellorsville? Should he stake everything on one last assault, throw all his men forward, like the old guard at Waterloo, and either win a crushing victory or die where the flags went down? Doubtless the blood of his old cavalier ancestors battled momentarily with his judgment as a commander, but judgment triumphed over impulse and, at length, he put down his glasses, he could not afford to attack with his weakened troops. If he could not attack the federal position, what should he do? What alternative was there? Deprived of the use of the Richmond and Danville Railroad, his main reliance for supplies, he must speedily get provisions if he was to continue fighting. How could he vittle the men and at the same time proceed with his retreat? It was the last major strategical question that he put to himself, and it was answered in a manner that accorded with his fame. The railroad supply lines left to him before he had quit Petersburg had formed a rough St. Andrew's Cross, thus. The lines met at Buckville, the junction that had been in his mind since February. He had lost his base at the upper end of the richmond bookville stretch of the Richmond and Danville, and he was cut off from the Bookville-Danville division. Behind him, the Federals in their first eruption had reached and had rendered useless the Bookville-Petersburg part of the Southside Railroad. All that was left to him of the four arms of the cross was that to the northwestward, from Bookville toward Lynchburg. He determined to strike across to that arm of the cross, to order supplies down it from Lynchburg, and then, having fed his army, to turn southwestward in the direction of Danville again. He would move on the dotted line shown on page 76. But how was he to get away from the enemy that stood across his path and was getting stronger every hour? He had lost his day's lead at Amelia, manifestly he could only regain it by a night's march. In this desperate throw against fate, everything depended on speed, and speed was the last thing that could be expected of an army in which the horses were ceasing to struggle any more and the men were beginning to drop from hunger.
There was, however, nothing left to do but to try it. Orders were given accordingly, though they may not have reached all the commands. Longstreet retraced his steps a short distance up the railroad and turned to the right. The other corps took the same general route only to find the roads jammed and progress almost impossible. It developed that the rumored attack on the wagon train had been a disastrous reality. Federal cavalry had swept down upon the trains before they had reached Paynaville on the road to Farmville and had driven off the guards. About 200 wagons had been burned and 320 soldiers, in addition to 310 Negro Teamsters, had been made prisoner. This attack on a narrow road in swampy ground blocked the way and stopped all movement of the trains. Six hours passed before the wheels of the wagons began to turn again. It was after night when the trains got to Paynaville, distant only about 10 miles by road from Amelia. This long tie-up made it necessary to reroute some of the wagons on the road the infantry were following toward Amelia Springs. The above sketch shows the terrain. The forced night march of April 5-6, now Lee's chief hope of escape, almost immediately became a slow stumble over crowded roads where confusion ruled and panic was easily spread. A black stallion, running away with a fence rail, swinging from his bridle, set men to shooting at one another in the darkness. Worse still, as the engineers had not considered the possibility of an advance on the road from the railway to Amelia Springs, they had not strengthened the bridge over a troublesome little stream known as Flat Creek, which crossed the road just before the springs were reached. The bridge broke down and halted the artillery and the wagons, though the infantry could ford the watercourse and keep on. Lee ate his supper at Selma, the home of Richard Anderson, about two miles from Amelia Springs. Anticipating a clash, he urged the hospitable family to see safety in the cellar. Then he hurried to the creek and sent for the engineer troops, who were still at Amelia Courthouse, where they had arrived that day. Probably while he was waiting for the engineers to come up, a courier brought Lee a message from Gordon, two spies had been captured, and from one of them had been taken dispatches that Gordon considered sufficiently important to forward for Lee's inspection. The small envelope was marked for quick delivery and was addressed to the Federal General Ord. Inside were two yellow tissue sheets, copies of messages of no great consequence, and a single white sheet on which in a sprawling hand was a note to Ord dated Jetersville, April 5, 1865, 10.10 p.m. It directed that officer to move at 8 a.m. the next morning and to take a position from which he could watch the roads between Buckville and Farmville. I am strongly of the opinion that Lee will leave Amelia tonight to go south. He will be pursued at 6 a.m. from here if he leaves. Otherwise, an advance will be made upon him where he is. This was signed you, S. Grant, Lieutenant G.N.L. There was no mistaking the meaning of this, Grant himself was at Jetersville, or at Buckville. The Army of the James, as well as the Army of the Potomac, was nearby in sufficient strength to pursue or to attack. It was the first certain information Lee had that Ord's troops from the north side of the James, the most distant federal units, were on his heels. The news showed the vigor of the pursuit and reinforced the urgency of speed and still more speed. Lee remained at the crossing until the engineers had arrived and had given assurance that the material for repairing the bridge was close at hand. Thence he rode on to Amelia Springs, just beyond Flat Creek, and there he at once adjusted his dispositions, so far as practicable, to the new development. The first obvious danger was, of course, that the wagon train would slow down the retreat of the army so much that the rear troops might be cut off. There was no way to be rid of the wagons, because the roads were few. The one route that was not to be used by the army led to the Appomattox at a point where, so far as Lee could ascertain, there was no bridge. The wagons, therefore, had to be taken along, and the rear closed up as well as was possible. Part of the cavalry could be utilized to cover the retreat and, as it happened, could use crossroads that were well suited for defense. Special pains must be taken to destroy the bridges. All this General Lee explained in a letter he wrote General Gordon at 4 a.m. in his own hand. I will try to get the head of the column on, he concluded, and to get provisions at Rice's station or Farmville. When he handed Gordon's staff officer this letter, Lee thought a moment before giving an answer to a verbal question Gordon had forwarded concerning the disposition of the two spies. Having been caught in Confederate uniform and having acknowledged themselves federal spies, these men were liable to immediate military execution. Gordon had asked whether this should be carried out.
Li pondered. Tell the general, he said at last, the lives of so many of our men are at stake that all my thoughts now must be given to disposing of them. Let him keep the prisoners until he hears further from me. Subsequently, the officers who carried and received this message concluded that Li deferred a decision in the belief that if the fate of his own army was to be settled speedily, he should not take the lives of his enemies needlessly. The second danger Li had to consider on the night of April 5-6 was one he discussed with Fitz Lee, who had driven off the federal attack on the wagon train near Paineville and had now ridden ahead of his command to Amelia Springs. This danger was that Sheridan would attack and destroy the wagon train as it groaningly crept to the southwest the next day. Already it was apparent that the United States cavalry had ceased operating against the Confederate rear and were preparing to move on a route parallel to Lee's left marching flank, a direful prospect. The only defense was caution in seeing that each command kept contact with the unit ahead and, exercising the greatest vigilance, stood ready to beat off attacks. Fitz Lee was to send all except one division of his cavalry toward Rice after Longstreet, but he was to remain in person to explain the situation to the first infantry commander to arrive. The division left behind was to guard the rear. In a word, the condition presented by the captured dispatch could not be removed strategically and had to be met tactically. With speed his one remaining weapon, Lee was confirmed in his decision that the movement of the whole army must continue through the night and on into the day with only such brief rest as was imperative. Longstreet was to remain in the van, and Lee determined to march with him in the hope of expediting the retreat. Behind Longstreet were to come Anderson, Ewell, and, in the rear, the alert, hard-hitting Gordon. Beyond Deatonsville, five miles west of Amelia Springs, all these troops and all the wheeled vehicles would have to use one road. And to this road, unfortunately, another ran almost parallel, just where the Federals could use it for dashes against the wagon trains. It was the gloomiest outlook Lee had yet faced on the retreat. Desperate since he had reached Amelia Courthouse and had found no provisions there, his situation might easily be rendered hopeless within 24 hours. Commissary General St. John reported at headquarters while Lee was at Amelia Springs. St. John had left Richmond not long before the Federals had entered the city on the morning of April 3, and he had been trying to hasten forward the wagons he had loaded in Richmond with the provisions he had not been able to send up the Danville Railroad on April 2 in answer to Colonel Cole's belated message. From St. John, probably, Lee learned for the first time why the rations had not been awaiting him at Amelia. He learned, also, that part of those that had been brought from the evacuated capital had been captured by the Federals near Clementown Bridge. The only encouragement St. John could give was that he had 80,000 rations at Farmville, which was 19 miles away. This food had been en route to the army when the Southside Railroad had been cut. After the cars had been halted at Buckville, they had been switched back up that line toward Farmville. Their contents would be available as soon as the army reached the railway. Should they be left at Farmville, asked General St. John, or should they be moved farther down the railroad, closer to the army? Lee said frankly that the military situation made it impossible to answer. What he apprehended, of course, was that the Federal cavalry might reach the railroad before he did, and might destroy the train. St. John accordingly went on to Farmville to prepare for the coming of the army and for the issuance of rations there. It was now the early morning of April 6, a dreadful day in the history of the Army of Northern Virginia. While Lee had been giving his orders and conferring in Amelia Springs, the column had been moving painfully forward, soldiers, wagons, and guns mingled together, men and horses tottering in their weakness and their misery. Straggling was perceptibly worse. The number of broken-down teams was larger. Many of the department clerks and reservists in Ewell's Corps, who were unaccustomed to marching, had to quit the road. Starting on the 3D with about 6,000, Ewell now had less than half that strength. As Lee rode forward to join Longstreet, there was something akin to despair in the eyes that were turned on him, and there was delirium in the loyal cheers that greeted him. Continuing to the vicinity of Rice, which is about 12 miles southwest of Amelia Springs and on the Southside Railroad, Lee awaited there the coming of the First Corps. Longstreet arrived during the forenoon with his men, after what must have been a very good march. Old Pete had information that some 600 or 700 mounted Federals had passed up the road toward Farmville, which is eight and a half miles by rail from Rice, and about seven by the old highway.
the object of these troops was presumably to burn the bridges over which part of Lee's army would pass in reaching that town. Longstreet immediately sent off cavalry in pursuit of these bluecoats. Hearing, also, that the enemy was in force about four miles to the southeastward, he took up line of battle covering the roads to Rice and at right angles to the railway. This intelligence of the nearness of the Federals was bad news for Lee. Still more ominous was a development about 10 a.m. After Longstreet had come up, Wilcox's and Haight's divisions had reported, and then Mahone. But Pickett, whose men were at the head of Anderson's little corps, had not closed on Mahone, as the marching orders required. Instead, there was a gap, and, after a little, word that the wagon train had been assailed some two miles back on the road. Lee heard of this while he was with General Pendleton. He at once directed that officer to collect what men he could and to see if he could stop the attack on the trains. Soon it was apparent that the Federals had fired the wagons they had reached. How strong they were and what support they had, Lee did not know. But the outlook was grim. With the column broken, the presence of Union cavalry on the flank of a far-spread wagon train meant danger and inevitable delay at a time when speed was everything. Besides, Lee was militarily in the dark, ahead of half his army. While waiting anxiously for the arrival of the head of Anderson's column, Lee examined the roads and the terrain around him. It was bad ground for a retreat. The meandering Appomattox found its way among hills that now were close to its channel and now set forbiddingly back from it, high and difficult of approach. The country on either side of the river was rolling and cut by many smaller streams. Some of these bogged between the hills. Others, mere branches in themselves, ran between declivities so steep that heavy bridges were necessary. The roads converged in the general direction of Farmville and were straightest and best from the very direction of the federal approach. There could hardly have been a stretch of Virginia countryside better suited for an attack by cavalry on an encumbered column of infantry. Particularly dangerous was the ground northwest of Rice, still to be traversed by the center and the rear guard. There were located the two forks and the watershed of a little stream called Sailor's Creek that flows northward into the Appomattox at a point where the river makes a loop to the southward as shown on the map, page 87. The crossings of this watercourse were much exposed. The bridges were weak and narrow. To the west of the creek were hills that presented a hard pull for teams and were not as strong a defensive position as they seemed because they were easily taken in rear. Over nearly the whole of the landscape grew dark pine woods, broken by scattered plantations and a few small farms, just the setting for a military tragedy. In examining this ground General Lee Road during the early afternoon, virtually without escort, toward the Appomattox River and the mouth of Sailor's Creek. There he found himself with Roberts's cavalry brigade. This little command of North Carolinians was not engaged, but it was watching something as ominous as it was unexpected, a fight in progress on the other side of the creek, between Gordon's corps and unidentified units of the enemy. Gordon was the rear guard, if he was being assailed, where were the central divisions? What had happened to them? Lee dismounted near a cabin, held Traveler by the bridle, and with the other hand took out his glasses to survey some white objects he saw in the distance. A young captain came up at the moment. Are those sheep or not? Lee asked doubtfully. No, General, said the possessor of younger eyes, they are Yankee wagons. Lee looked again through his glasses and then said slowly, you are right, but what are they doing there? What did it mean that the federal wagon trains, which normally followed the troops, were already up, and no word from Anderson or Ewell, who were marching ahead of Gordon, 25? Riding back in a few minutes, toward the line on which these corps should be moving, Lee soon met General Mahone, who had been engaged the previous evening in a verbal encounter with Colonel Charles Marshall. Lee had thought Mahone in the wrong, and he proceeded now to remonstrate with him on the tone he had employed. While they were talking, Colonel Venable rode up and asked if Lee had received his message. No, said the general. Then Venable told him that the enemy had captured those of the wagons that were between the branches of Sailor's Creek. Where is Anderson? exclaimed General Lee. Where is Ewell? It is strange, I can't hear from them. Then he turned. General Mahone, he said, I have no other troops. Will you take your division to Sailor's Creek? <laughs>
Mahone gave the order, the men started, Lee and Mahone went ahead of them, Colonel Venable behind the two. They rode on a high ridge leading northward to the Appomattox, and then they turned to the right and came to the elevation overlooking the creek. The landscape opened up on the instant for a long distance across the valley. Lee stopped and straightened himself in his saddle and stared at what he saw. It was such a sight as his eyes had never beheld in the years of his command of the Army of Northern Virginia, streaming out of the bottom and up the ridge to them were teamsters without their wagons, soldiers without their guns, and shattered regiments without their officers, a routed wreck. My God, cried Lee, as if to himself, has the army been dissolved? Mahone, whose heart was in his mouth, swallowed and struggled and at last answered stoutly, No, General, here are troops ready to do their duty. Lee regained his poise on the instant. Yes, General, he said, there are some true men left. Will you please keep those people back? As Mahone hurried away to draw a line of battle, Lee spurred forward to rally the men who were running toward him. Either from the ground where the bearer had dropped it in his flight, or else from the hand of some color bearer, Lee took a battle flag and held it aloft. There on Traveler he sat, the red folds of bunting flapping about him, the soldiers in a mob in front of him, some wild with fear, some exhausted, some wounded. A few rushed on, others looked up and, recognizing him, began to flock around him as if to find shelter in his calm presence. Did it flash over him then that this was the last rally of the Great Army of Northern Virginia? 26. Chapter 7 A Letter Comes to Headquarters there on the hill above Sailor's Creek the fugitives gathered fast. For all of them, as for Pickett's survivors after the fatal charge at Gettysburg, Lee had encouragement. Mahone's men would protect them, he said, the enemy would not overtake them. They must go to the rear and form again. It's General Lee, the encouraged soldiers began to cry. Where's the man who won't follow Uncle Robert? Mahone soon returned and took the battle flag from the general's hand. Lee reached for his binoculars and began to study the valley and the hills beyond it, in the hope of discovering how he should dispose his thin line to halt the enemy's advance. Presently, in the backwash of the retreating troops, there arrived a general of exalted grade, whose name merciful history does not record. Lee was sweeping the field with his glasses at the moment, the reins loose on Traveler's neck, his attitude full of alertness and pugnacity. Not a glance did he give to the newcomer. General Lee, said one of his staff officers, here is General. Lee did not lower his glasses or honor the beaten commander with a nod. All he did was to move his right hand to the rear in a gesture of biting reproach. General, he said slowly, take those stragglers to the rear, out of the way of Mahone's troops. I wish to fight here. The character of the debacle was not yet known, but its magnitude was obvious. Gordon presumably was still fighting at the lower crossing of the creek, but Ewell and Anderson somehow had met disaster. The capture of their commands was the most natural thing to surmise, for those refugees who came up to Lee brought with them tales of whole divisions surrounded and Federals springing up everywhere with cries of surrender. What should be done? Lee put the question to Mahone as he always did to whosoever was nearest him when he was thinking aloud on some military problem. Mahone had a suggestion. Together they worked out a plan for Longstreet to march on to Farmville while Mahone held his position. Later in the night Mahone was to withdraw through the woods and cross the Appomattox on the Southside Railroad Bridge. He was to hold the crossing until all the troops, guns, and wagons had passed, and then the engineers were to burn both that high span and the lower wagon bridge under the hill. Colonel Talcott, who was nearby, was immediately called up and assigned to this duty. No provision could be made as yet for Gordon, for the outcome of his battle was not yet plain. The bridges, of course, were to be held for him if he got away. In sketch, the plan is shown above. It was now nearly dusk. Worn and already so tired that he had stretched himself on the ground to rest during the evening, Lee rode back to Longstreet's lines at Rice. He found all quiet there. The cavalry that had been sent off during the morning had overtaken the Federals who were aiming to burn the high bridge over the Appomattox and had killed or captured nearly all of them. Enemy infantry had appeared during the afternoon southeast of Rice and had come within a mile of the place but had not attacked seriously.
Longstreet's forces were intact, and Gordon's had been located, though they were still hotly and dangerously engaged, but it was soon apparent that these and the cavalry were now nearly all that was left of the army. As the details were put together, the tragedy that had overtaken the other troops stood out unrelieved. From early forenoon Anderson had been following Longstreet's wagons. Ewell had been behind Anderson. Then had come the greater part of the wagon train, and then Gordon, closing the rear. The long, enfeebled column had crept on toward Sailor's Creek, but had been repeatedly engaged. The Federal cavalry would charge up from the Geneto Road, south and southeast of the route of the army, and would feel out the strength of the forces marching with the wagons. Repulsed by the infantry, who formed line of battle to protect the trains, the Federals would ride on ahead and strike again and still again, always in search of some weak spot. About 11 a.m., the Union troops were attacking Gordon so vigorously in the rear and were demonstrating so heavily that Anderson and Ewell halted where they were in order to permit the wagons to pass and thereby to keep Gordon from being cut off while covering the trains. Anderson had orders that he should close on Mahone's division, which was the rear command under Longstreet, but Anderson did not notify Mahone that he was halting. As a consequence, Mahone marched on and left behind him an hourly widening gap between him and the van of Pickett's division, the leading unit of Anderson's command. Unprotected wagon trains were moving through this gap, near the large Harper Plantation, on the upper stretches of Sailor's Creek and between the branches, when Federal cavalry bore down on them. The bluecoats reached the wagon train and burned a small part of it. This was the attack General Lee had asked General Pendleton to try and repulse when he had heard of it during the forenoon. The eruption of the Federals, of course, partially blocked the road, caused Anderson's troops to halt and made progress slower, but at length, about 2 p.m., the remaining wagons ahead of Anderson began to move once more. Gordon was then close on Ewell's rear, and all the wagon trains between Ewell and Gordon seemed to be safe. When the leading troops of Anderson's command reached the point where the wagons had been fired, they found Union cavalry across the road in great strength. General Wise at once extemporized an assault with his brigade and drove the Federals to the south, but he was greatly outnumbered, and as he had not communicated to his immediate superior his intention of attacking, he was not supported by the rest of Johnston's division and had to withdraw. Meantime, and apparently with no knowledge of what Wise was doing, Anderson rode back to the head of Ewell's column to find its commander and to tell him that the enemy had the road ahead. Ewell had already heard this from Fitz Lee, who chanced to be passing, and he had directed the wagon trains to leave the main route of the army east of Sailor's Creek and to take a more northerly road over a lower crossing so that they would escape the obstacle of the burned vehicles. No word of this change of the route of the wagon trains, however, was sent to Gordon, who was following Ewell but was not in direct touch with him. When Anderson and Ewell met, it was clear that they must either attack and drive off the enemy or else leave the road, skirt around the Federals, and seek a way that would lead to Farmville. Ewell was for the latter course, but as he had not been over the ground and as Anderson had, he left the decision to the South Carolinian. Anderson chose to deliver a joint attack to clear the line of march. Before the dispositions for this could be made, however, federal troops began to appear in large numbers in Ewell's rear. This was because Gordon, who had been following Ewell and had been heavily engaged, had assumed, in the absence of any word to the contrary, that the route of the wagons was that of the infantry, as it had been all day. He had filed off after the trains, the federals had found the gap and had plunged in. The result was that while Anderson was about to be attacked in front, Ewell's corps was to be assaulted from the rear. Perceiving this, Anderson told Ewell that he, Ewell, would have all he could do on his line and that the attack to clear the road ahead would have to be made with Anderson's own command. Anderson rode away for this purpose and Ewell prepared his line of battle to resist the federal assault. Back to back, the corps made ready, Anderson facing west, Ewell east. In Ewell's command was the naval battalion under Commodore Tucker, which answered orders with the sailors, I, I, sir. Here, also, were heavy artillerists from the James River defenses, some of whom had probably never been under musketry fire in their whole career as soldiers. Custis Lee commanded them and the local defense troops. The other division was Kershaw's, consisting of a remnant, some 1,600, of the veterans of the First Corps. Anderson's attack was not well organized and failed almost before it was launched. Ewell's defense was stubborn and included one spirited counterattack, but it was in vain.
Anderson's troops were captured, except for Wise's brigade and a few scattered individuals who escaped through the woods, the men whom Lee had seen from the other side of Sailor's Creek. Ewell's corps was taken in front, in flank, and in rear, and after hand-to-hand -hand fighting, where the bayonet was used, was forced to surrender. Ewell lost 2,800, in this way, Anderson perhaps 1,500. The two corps, as fighting units, virtually ceased to exist. Lee told only the somber truth when he said to Pendleton, General, that half of our army is destroyed. The weary commander probably was still gathering the details of the disaster to Ewell and to Anderson on Sailor's Creek when this note came from Gordon, marked 5 p.m. I have been fighting heavily all day. My loss is considerable and I am still closely pressed. I fear that a portion of the train will be lost as my force is quite reduced and insufficient for its protection. So far, I have been able to protect them, but without assistance, can scarcely hope to do so much longer. The enemy's loss has been very heavy. As he had covered the rear, Gordon had been so closely pursued that he had been forced before noon to halt a division, to throw up works across the road, to pass the other divisions through, and then to repeat the process with the second division and the third. Once he was compelled to form line of battle along the hills at Deatonsville, and with Jones's artillery and W. H. F. Lee's division of cavalry, to retard the enemy until the road in front of him was clear of wagons for a mile. Then he set out again and having turned to the right, as already noted, caught up with the wagon trains at an exceedingly bad crossing near the mouth of Sailor's Creek. The cavalry had been withdrawn by this time, so his three small and tired divisions had to hold off the Federals on the east side of the creek until the wagons got over. The direct assault of the enemy was successfully repulsed. Soon afterward, however, the Federals who had overrun Ewell's front massed for a new charge on Gordon. It was at this juncture that he wrote Lee. Probably before the dispatch was received, Lee could not have given assistance even had word come earlier, Gordon was again attacked. Once more he drove back his assailants, but about six o'clock he was assaulted heavily in front and on both flanks. His exhausted divisions broke, got across the creek as best they could, and formed again, after a fashion, on the west bank, in the darkness. Gordon lost by capture some 1,700. These, added to the men taken from Ewell and Anderson and those who straggled and fell into the hands of the enemy during the day, brought the Federal's Hall of Prisoners to at least 6,000. With the killed and wounded counted in, the day had cost Lee not less than 7,000 and perhaps 8,000 men. The Southern commander now had only six divisions that could be counted as fighting organizations and but two of these, Fields and Mahones, were of any size. The cavalry mounts were nearly dead, though the troopers who had been able to keep their horses going were still capable of putting up a fight. The artillery was reduced by about 50 percent in personnel and still further in guns. To oppose on the Moro four corps of infantry and four divisions of cavalry, a total of 80,000 men, all within striking distance and with sufficient food and ammunition, Lee could not muster more than 12,000 reliable muskets and 3,000 sabers. Every hour's was to see that number perceptibly diminished, for men who had held their nerves under control and had silenced their protesting stomachs were dropping fast. Each halt meant that some soldiers would not be able to obey the fall-in when the column moved forward again. Lee permitted himself no inferences that night. Nor, where everything was contingent on hour-by-hour -hour developments, could he plan far ahead. Obviously there was still a chance of escaping with what remained of his army if he could rest and reorganize his men. For then, he could widen in the direction of Lynchburg the arc of his retreat to the southwest and might still outmarch the enemy. At the least, he could execute the first part of this movement. He could cross to the north bank of the Appomattox, burn the bridges near Farmville, and give his men the repose that was now as much a necessity as food. He might even in this way deceive the enemy and get a new lead. So long as this chance was open to him, his sense of duty did not permit him to consider any alternative. Soon after he returned to Rice, about sundown, he gave orders for Longstreet to resume the retreat via Farmville, in the direction of Lynchburg. The guns were withdrawn, and the troops started moving shortly after dark. Fields, Hates, and Wilcox's divisions, together with the wagon trains of the whole army, were now put on the road, a very bad one at that. The cavalry moved in Longstreet's rear. The orders to the officers collecting the scattered units were that they should get the men across the Appomattox and reform them there.
Mahone and Gordon were to go over the river via the high bridge. From Lynchburg, the post commandant had wired that the Federals were advancing down the Virginia Tennessee Railroad and that he wished to know if reinforcements could be sent. Lee answered that this could not be done, that Lynchburg must be held, if practicable, and that, if it could not be, supplies should be sent to Farmville or as far down the road toward that town as possible. Long after the leading troops had resumed the march toward Farmville, Lee remained at his temporary headquarters in a field north of Rice. He had a campfire of fence rails close to his ambulance. For a time he stood by the wheel of the vehicle, looking into the fire and dictating to his only secretary, Colonel Marshall, who was sitting by a lantern in the ambulance, writing out Lee's orders on a lap desk. Soon afterward, Lee rode on to Farmville and went to the home of Patrick Jackson on Beach Street, where he sought a few hours' rest. Very early on the morning of April 7, as he prepared to leave, his hostess met him with an invitation to breakfast. He declined with his wanted courtesy, on the ground that he did not feel like eating. Mrs. Jackson pressed him, isn't there something we can fix for you, General? Her manner was so earnestly solicitous that he confessed he had for days been wanting a cup of tea. Fortunately, and most oddly in the general distress of the times, the family had a little tea that had been put away against the day of need. It was quickly brought forth and brewed. Lee drank it gratefully. It must have been from Mrs. Jackson's that Lee directed Traveller to the home of Mrs. John T. Thornton, which was nearly opposite. Dismounting, he entered and greeted the widow of one of the most gallant of his regimental cavalry commanders, killed two years and a half previously during the Maryland expedition. I have not time to tarry, he said with deep emotion, but I could not pass by without stopping for a moment to pay my respects to the widow of my honored soldier, Colonel Thornton, and to tender her my deep sympathy in the sore bereavement which she sustained when the country was deprived of his invaluable services. Then he went on to survey the situation. One relief, if only one, was in sight. General St. John had reached Farmville from Amelia Springs the previous day. He had found the provisions sent from Buckville on the approach of the enemy, 80,000 rations of meal and about 40,000 of bread, and he had set about collecting voluntary contributions of grain, which he had the mills grind at once. He had dispatched three couriers to Lee on the afternoon of the 6th with a report and a request for protection of the trains, though apparently none of these reached Lee. Now General St. John turned over all he had to Lee's commissary for issue to the troops, many of whom had received no regular rations since April 2, five days previously. The starving time, it seemed, at last was over. The wagon train was arriving, the artillery was coming up, the head of Longstreet's column was close at hand. There was, however, a touch of new personal suspense for Lee in a meeting with Custis's courier, Dick Manson. When Lee asked eagerly how his son had fared in the Battle of Sailor's Creek, Manson could only answer that he had been sent off the previous morning and did not know what fate had befallen his commander. Lee now rode to the north side of the Appomattox to locate the troops that had escaped the disaster at Sailor's Creek and had been ordered to cross the Appomattox at High Bridge. He soon found Major General Bushrod R. Johnson, who reported that his division had been destroyed, but very shortly Lee saw marching toward him in good order the largest of the brigades of Johnson's division, headed by General Wise. That veteran was afoot, wrapped in a gray blanket in lieu of a cloak, wearing a strange hat cocked on one side, and showing plainly on his face the red of the mud puddle in which he had washed. Weary as he was, Lee scarcely could repress his smile at the appearance of Wise. Calmly, he asked what was the condition of Wise's command. Ready for dress parade, answered Wise proudly, and proceeded to demand provisions for his troops. Lee promised food and directed him to deploy his men across the hill. Wise, he went on, was to organize and take command of the stragglers who, despairingly and in large numbers, were streaming toward them. There followed a colloquy in which Wise sought to make it plain that General Bushrod Johnson, who was still sitting nearby, was to be accounted a straggler and had left his troops. Do you mean to say, General Lee, inquired Wise, that I must take command of all men of all ranks? Wise was satisfied that Lee, as he understood the significance of his question, turned his head to conceal another smile. Do your duty, sir, was all Lee said. He added, privately no doubt, that General Wise would do well to wash his face again. Behind Wise's brigade and the stragglers, but probably not reported at this hour, the survivors of Gordon's corps were moving up. 
they had crossed at High Bridge, as directed, were marching along the railroad track and would be ready to rejoin the rest of the army when Longstreet moved to the north side of the Appomattox. Ere long, General Breckinridge, the Secretary of War, arrived at temporary headquarters. Lee at once went into conference with him, but neither he nor Breckinridge left any account of the interview. Breckinridge got the impression that Lee's move across the Appomattox was for temporary relief, and he reported to Mr. Davis the next day that Lee on the 7th would still try to move around toward North Carolina. The secretary, himself a soldier of ability, was quick to see the desperate plight of the army. The straggling has been great, he telegraphed, and the situation is not favorable. Longstreet's troops were now coming into Farmville, and the advanced units were marching across the bridge and to the north side, where they were to halt and cook their long-awaited rations. The cavalry was following them, with the understanding that when they had passed, the two bridges, that of the railroad and that on the plank road, were to be burned. If this were done, and if the two crossings at High Bridge had been destroyed, as previously ordered, then Lee would have at least some chance to rest his army and to resume his march ahead of the enemy, because the river could not be forded by infantry, though it was passable by cavalry. The sketch on page 98 shows the position of the bridges. Just at this hopeful moment came dire news. All Lee's plans were suddenly set at naught. Federal infantry were already on the north bank of the river and were moving rapidly upstream toward the flank of the tired forces that were frying their bacon in the belief that at last they were safe from alarms. It developed that a grievous blunder had been made. Down the river, at High Bridge, where General Mahone had been stationed as rear guard, the railroad span had been set afire in time to be burning freely before the enemy reached it, but the wagon bridge in the valley, a much smaller affair, had been lighted too late. Barlow's division of the two corps had gone down to it, had put the flames out and had marched rapidly across it. By nine o'clock the first division of the same corps was moving easily over it. The delay in setting the wagon bridge afire seems to have been due to misunderstanding of the usual sort. The engineers had been directed to burn the bridges on word from General Mahone. He either forgot to give the orders in time or else thought the engineers were to act without him. Mahone made an attempt to retake the bridgehead, but failed. Thereupon he was forced to withdraw, though he put up stiff resistance to the Federal advance, some three miles from Farmville. Gordon's corps, which was ahead of Mahone, had light skirmishing. General Lee exploded when he got word of the blunder. With vehemence unrestrained he voiced his opinion of the act and its authors, the last hope of the shattered army was being allowed to slip away. Lee's rage was soon subdued, however, and his mind was put to work to redeem once more, it was to be nearly the last time, the military mistakes of others. He sent for Alexander, told him what had happened, showed him on the map where the Federals could strike the road of the Confederate retreat three miles ahead, and directed him to move artillery to protect the position. When Alexander pointed out that the Federals on the south side of the river would have a shorter march, Lee neither resented the observation nor stopped to explain that he had no choice of route because he had to keep close to the railroad in order to meet his supply trains and to feed his men. He merely folded up his map and said there would be time enough to look after that. In telling Alexander to send forward the guns to the place he had designated, Lee also entrusted to him the destruction of the two bridges at Farmville, that of the railway and that on the plank road. Alexander was enjoined to see that the crossings were not burned before the Confederate cavalry had passed and that they were not to be left so long that the Federals could extinguish the fire and utilize them. The order was given none too soon. Federal cavalry, they proved to be crooks, were pressing so closely behind the Confederates' horses that Fitzley had to make a stand on the outskirts of Farmville and in the very streets of the town to permit Longstreet's rearguard and the stragglers to clear the bridges. By 11 a.m. the advance of that troublesome, fast-moving VI Corps was on the hills overlooking Farmville from the south. The bridges were then fired and caught aflame rapidly before the Confederate cavalry could break off the skirmish and cross. The arrival of the Federals caused a near stampede among the Teamsters and scattered units on the north side of the river and prompted General Lee to order an immediate resumption of the retreat. He was concerned for the moment, also, less part of the cavalry had been cut off and lost, and he insisted that the head of Longstreet's column start at the double quick. The issue of rations had to be suspended, even though a large part of the army had received nothing.
In retrospect, at least, Longstreet attributed Lee's precipitancy to something akin to panic and he stated that he tried to reassure his chief by telling him that the cavalry would certainly find and use a nearby ford. Longstreet apparently did not realize how close the danger was. Envelopment was threatened, no time was to be lost. The cars containing provisions were sent farther up the railroad in the hope that they might be overtaken on the march, which was to be north of and then approximately parallel to the line. Lee went up the road with Longstreet's column some two miles and a half to the coal pits north of Farmville. There, to his relief, he found the cavalry and learned that the Confederates had located a ford some miles above the Plank Road Bridge and had crossed safely. The cavalry at the moment were covering the wagon train which was moving toward the main highway over Lackland's Mill Road, described by Stevens as terribly bad. Lee sat down under an oak tree and was resting his back against it when Federal cavalry, who had used the ford by which Fitz Lee had crossed, advanced for another attack on the wagons. The troubled commander slowly got up, mounted his horse and rode past the Confederate troopers, who gave him a cheer. He lifted his hat in acknowledgement and soon paused to watch the fight. Under his eyes, one division met the oncoming Federals in front and another took them in flank. The enemy's attack was broken up brilliantly. Many of the Federals were captured, including their commander, Brigadier General J. Irvin Gregg. The survivors were routed. Lee's spirits, which always rose when action was joined, were much improved by the success. Keep your command together and in good spirits, General, don't let them think of surrender, I will get you out of this, he told his son Rooney Lee after General Gregg had been taken. It was a courageous remark, but it was ominous in that it showed General Lee knew the men were talking of surrender. It was the first time, too, so far as is known, that Lee in his own conversation had recognized such a contingency on the retreat. Lee held the cavalry where it could meet another attack, and he sent Mahon's division to the position taken by the artillery which Alexander had duly sent forward to the point where the road of the Federal advance met the road of Lee's march. This position was near Cumberland Church and Price's Farm, a little more than three miles north of Farmville. Mahon drew up line of battle there, entrenched, and prepared to cover the passage of the wagons and of the army. Gordon's corps, which had now come up, moved by the left flank through the woods to protect the wagons. Owing to the condition of the animals and to the badness of the road by which the wagons were moving, the march was exceedingly slow in getting underway. The army had virtually no start when Federal infantry began to appear in much strength on Mahone's front. In the afternoon, they attacked and tried to turn the division's left, which was almost in the air. The cavalry who were covering the flank were driven in, and a battery was taken temporarily. The whole of the infantry had to stop, and both Gordon and Longstreet had to send Mahone help. He then beat off the attack and delivered a countercharge in which he took some prisoners. Lee congratulated the men, but he could not presume on this momentary advantage. He did not dare attempt his usual solution of such a problem, namely, an offensive against the troops that threatened his road. The wagons were still close at hand, most of the infantry had been moving with little or no rest for a minimum of 18 hours, and some of them had been almost constantly on the move since nightfall of the 5th, more than 40 hours. The strength of the Federals on the right and rear of the army was not known. Lee did not feel that he could afford to withdraw Mahone from his strong position until darkness. The failure to burn the wagon bridge below High Bridge was costing him dearly for the Federals south of the river had been somewhat mystified by his movements and, if Humphreys's two corps had been kept back at High Bridge, Lee might have had something of the advantage that McClellan gained by crossing to the south side of the Chickahominy on the night of June 27, 1862. As it was, the start that had been so vigorously begun at the Double Quick near Farmville came to this maddening halt within four miles and in plain sight of the enemy. Lee did not complain because of his inability to move from Cumberland Church, but at least once in the afternoon he displayed the petulance that always was the surest sign of a battle for self-mastery. He had ridden out toward Mahone's line and was watching the fire of one of Chamberlain's batteries when a staff officer from Gordon came up the side of the hill next the enemy. Lee waited until the officer had given his message and then he pointed out his mistake in exposing himself unnecessarily. The officer answered that he was ashamed to shelter himself when he saw the commanding general sitting in plain view of the Federals. Lee flared up and answered rather sharply, It is my duty to be here. I must see.
Go back the way I told you, sir. A small incident surely, but it was remembered and repeated, evil was the day when Moss Robert employed even that mild tone of rebuke, 61. As darkness fell, Lee went to a cottage near Mahone's lines and close to Cumberland Church to spend the night. Longstreet soon joined him there. About half past nine, or perhaps a little later, a courier came up from Mahone's front with a dispatch for the commanding general. Lee opened it himself and read Headquarters Armies of the United States. April 7, 1865, 5 p.m. General R. E. Lee. Commanding C. S. Army. General, the results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so, and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the C.S. Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. U.S. Grant. Lieutenant General. Commanding Armies of the United States. General Lee studied it without a word or sign and then silently passed it to Longstreet, who was sitting near him. Longstreet read it, also, and handed it back. Not yet, he said. 